of Tobago. And so almost every day that student year, when I opened my book, I saw the courthouse of Tobago. Now why was the picture there? Well, it's now more than 200 years uh, since the case of Buchanan against Rucker was decided. Do any of you remember that case? Um, it's a case in which a judgment made in Tobago uh, against a foreign non-Tobago uh, defendant was sought to be enforced in the English courts. Enforcement was resisted on the basis that notice had been given simply by nailing a piece of paper on the door of that courthouse, that same courthouse that I looked at every time I opened my textbook. Um, and as Professor Reese asked us, I remember arms outstretched and quoting the, the English judge who denied recognition of the, of the notice, can Topago pass a law to bind the rights of the whole world? That was the question we were asked. Um, Buchanan was a landmark case. And for me, therefore, this is a spiritual journey. But for all of us, the Buchanan case should be a reminder of the long-standing juridical ties, the legacy that binds lawyers in Trinidad and Tobago with lawyers in London. If nothing else, globalization and technology make those ties even more relevant today. Today, we, sh we will hear about recent jurisprudence, I'm sure cases, many of them much more recent than Buchanan, and we'll hear about the relevant experience of our speakers. Relevant as we position ourselves as a profession to be helpful to our clients uh, as best we can be to, so that they can meet the challenges that, that confront them. Globalization and technology are our opportunities. And um, they will, however, add to the, the, the scale of the task that's before us. The facts are always important, and the facts are changing. But let's not put our heads in the sand about those changing facts and circumstances. Let's put our heads together. Let's put our heads together and, and uh, use this opportunity that we have today to strengthen the collaborations that will help us serve those clients and maybe even give competitive advantage. In any event, I just wanted to welcome you to the conference. Um, we welcome the opportunity of it. And now let me pass the microphone back to Mr. Bissessor, uh, who will chair the morning session. If you stay the course, if you're here this afternoon, you're going to hear from me again. And I hope to see you when I come back after lunch. Thanks very much. Tobago Legal Network, the TTLN, initials I want you to become familiar with. You will be hearing more from the TTLN, but it is in fact a foundation which was incorporated on the 28th of April this year. Its principal mandate, ladies and gentlemen, is to promote and provide continuing legal education to members of the legal profession and persons who are interested in the law, as well as being a forum for scholarly debate on important legal issues and, of course, contemporary public events in Trinidad and Tobago. The TTLN is a non-partisan organization. It is not aligned to any political party or philosophy, save that it encourages and holds very dear to its heart strict adherence to the rule of law and a citizen's right to due process. The TTLN's president is Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Miraj, senior counsel, and I serve as its secretary director. Mrs. Vijaya Miraj and Mrs. Niala Badal also serve as directors. The TTLN was formally launched at last night at a gala ceremony at the Courtyard Marriott Hotel. And in fact, today, consistent with its mandate, is presenting its inaugural law conference, which, as I've indicated, is titled The Recent Contribution of the Caribbean to the, to the Common and Constitutional Law. And of course, we are convening in the Aubrey Frazier Theatre 
which at Hubert Ing Law School. And let me pause to acknowledge with our gratitude um, the, uh, the law school for hosting us. It's a very important event and I'm very happy that we have many students and members of faculty in our audience. The law conference is hosted or in fact co-hosted by various chambers including um, RLM and Company, Dalton's, three here court from the United Kingdom and my own chambers. Many of you would have received your packages and you would have had an opportunity or bit briefly to look at the program. But if you have, you will, be, you will have seen that we are in fact presenting papers, um, several of them, for instance, Sir Fenton Ram Sohoy on the justice trajectory post-independence, an intriguing title, and I'm sure like myself you're keen to hear from him in relation to that. Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Miraj is presenting on the Supreme Court as the guardian of the Constitution. Mr. Peter Knox, QC, who is head of Tree Hair Court, is presenting on an overview of uh, recent cases from the Caribbean. Mr. Janus Guthrie, QC, is presenting on judicial bias. Later this afternoon, Mr. John Jeremy, senior counsel, is presenting on parliamentary privilege. And also this afternoon, Mr. Thomas Rowe, QC, is also presenting on dissenting judgments. There are other contributions. And in fact, this afternoon, I am really looking forward to our panel discussion, which concludes our conference. It's one at about 2.30 this afternoon. And some panel discussion on uh, contributions of the common law and recent events. But having said that, its chair, Mr. Simon Davenport, um, QC, has invited me to remind you that he will uh, be considering and the panel, which comprises persons from both the United Kingdom um, bar, as well as, of course, our Commonwealth bar as panelists. To, to listen to and perhaps um, offer views on contemporary events in Trinidad and Tobago, not matters just purely related to the papers that you are presenting or are being presented. So it's not going to be a fairly dry exposition. It's going to be very live, dynamic, and I hope fairly provocative as well. So that's, on, that's, uh, that's our morsels for this afternoon. Good. Our first paper is being presented by Professor Satvinder Just, and it is entitled Legitimate Expectations. Sadvinder is in fact a member of Three Hair Court, but I was chatting with him a little earlier and he gave me an intriguing background. He was born in colonial East Africa, it's now called Tanzania, and he had an idyllic childhood in the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. He was making the point that his family emigrated in 1968 to the United Kingdom because of very, uh, a lot of political strife, and in fact, those events have shaped his contribution, which is really relating to constitutional and public law, and fired his zeal and his zest for the rule of law. Yes. His particular expertise is in comparative constitutional law and public administrative law, and his practice includes, of course, judicial reviews, as well as hearings in the High Court and the Court of Appeal. He also has considerable experience in immigration and refugee law and various fields of human rights practice, from employment law to education law and he appears regularly in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, as well as in the Privy Council. He sits as a deputy chair, I'm sorry, a deputy judge of the Upper Tribunal hearing immigration and asylum cases, and is a former human rights fellow from Harvard University and a Harkness Fellow. He is a professor and the director of the MA, of the MA course at, in International Peace and Security at the Law School at uh, King's College in, in London and specializes in international refugee law and in human rights, public law, and comparative law cases. In October 2012, Sidvinder was appointed to the panel of the Welsh government's panel of counsel to undertake public law and employment work. He was appointed to the panel as counsel and, serve, and serving the Equality and Human Rights Commission with effect from the 2nd of March 2015 for a term of four years. He's also on the panel of arbitrators of the Indian Council of Arbitration of which he's of course a life member. He has written widely uh, in various journals in the UK and in the USA and is author of five books including International Migration and Global Justice and he's in fact currently um, has, has accepted briefs from many countries including the governments of Trinidad and Tobago, Belize and Bermuda. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Sadvinder Jass who will now present his paper entitled Legitimate Expectations. And uh, warm words. Uh, not sure if you want to hear anything further from me, given that subversive background that's just been outlined. Uh, but even so, um, London, recently, uh, there was discussion on the meaning of words uh, used in common parlance, and a, 
panel member was asked to distinguish uh, between the meaning of uh, to complete and to finish, uh, he confessed to some difficulty given that uh, both Roger's thesaurus and uh, the shorter Oxford English Dictionary uh, seemed to imply that both words had exactly the same meaning, to which someone from the audience quipped to say that there was a distinction. If one married the right person, one was complete, and if one married the wrong person, one was finished. <laughs> to, to which one might add that uh, if uh, the right person catches you with the wrong person, then you're completely finished. Uh, take heed all of, the, all of those you who were parting late last night. Uh, I, I mention that simply because I have 20 minutes in which to cover a very difficult area, vast area, and I propose to do so um, in the following way. Firstly, uh, to tell you why legitimate expectations is such a crucial area. It is, as Ramesh told me even yesterday, the most important explosive area of public law in Trinidad. There are, uh, you know, an entire spate of cases coming through uh, that have to be resolved, uh, and that's one reason. Uh, the second reason is this, that um, the doctrine itself is hugely problematic. Um, Lord Brown, in a 2020 case, to which I hope I shall have time to take you through, referred to it as a little more than a mechanism uh, to dispose palm tree justice. Uh, he picked that up from an academic article, someone no doubt... Uh, with a whiff of envy, given that there are no palm trees back in England. Begrudge you rather for having yours. But in any event, that just shows how difficult the area is. What I propose to do, therefore, is to simply take you firstly in just five or ten minutes with the basic nuts and bolts of legitimate expectations. And just to give an understanding of how clients, practitioners, others listening on the radio would be able to use uh, this very difficult doctrine, judgment doctrine, at the heart of the English common law, entirely created by, by the judiciary. And secondly, then also, once I've gone through that, to take you through maybe one or two time-permitting cases to see exactly how uh, this has panned out in real life. And Trinidad produces you know, a uh, rich tapestry of such case law. There's Paponet, there's the Clico case, there are other cases coming through. Uh, so really it's right at the forefront of uh, developing the jurisprudence here. So let me then begin firstly with the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, legitimate expectation is a judge-made doctrine which protects the citizen from changes of mind, changes of policy by public bodies. Uh, the basis of the court's uh, protection is said to be fairness rather than any private or legal right per se. The thing to watch out for is this, that the conduct of the authority has to be so unfair as to amount to an abuse of power. Unless you can show that there is a real abuse of power, you get nowhere. Uh, so that's the critical thing to, to bear in mind. Um, let's then look at how this would really work out. Well, I have a dozen points on that. Let's begin with the first one. First to the statement. Your statement from the government body can go to two issues. One, either creating a procedural uh, legitimate expectation, which is the older of the two, that has a much more uh, difficult, much less difficult uh, basis, or a substantive uh, legitimate expectation. Let me deal with the easy one, the procedural. The second point is this, that the procedural legitimate expectation is to do with an interest or the continuance or acquisition of a benefit uh, where the law requires the body in question to adopt a fair procedure before they reach the decision in, in, in question. So really, it's what they must do. I mean, procedures, as you know, are very, very important. They are gateways to justice. They really are the steps that require, uh, enable you to uh, acquire the remedy which, you, which you're after. The procedure may also be based upon an expectation that a particular procedure would be followed because it has been followed in the past uh, or promised for in the future. So it can be either past in terms of established practice or future in terms of what you want the government to do before they reach the decision in question. Um, thirdly, uh, let's then look at substantive uh, legitimate expectations. Well, this, as I say, is much, much more difficult. And what this requires is this. It says that um, for a public body in question, there must be a representation which is, quote, clear, unambiguous, and devoid of relevant qualification. And that third is really where the difficulty lies. You may very often have clear, unambiguous uh, representations, but are they really devoid of relevant qualification? 
And in addition, secondly, the uh, government uh, or public body uh, must be one which cannot show that there is an overriding public interest which justifies reneging from that expectation, defeating that expectation. So unless you can point to such public uh, overriding interest, it really is bound to follow the representation that it gave. Fourthly, what is the burden of proof that has to be satisfied? And upon whom does that burden lie? Well, obviously, first and foremost, it lies on the claimant. He who alleges must prove. The claimant must show that uh, there is a undertaking given. Uh, there has to be a sufficient evidence giving rise to a substantive legitimate expectation. And secondly, once the claimant has uh, dealt with that burden of proof upon him, it then shifts upon the government to show that um, uh, there is ample evidence justifying the necessity for a breach of that expectation. Now, I go through this area of burden of proofs, even though Lord Brown in the Papanet case said that, look, this is just far too uh, unnecessary because the whole talk of uh, burdens of proof is... Uh, entirely inappropriate in the context of which, what is being argued here. But even so, the rest of the board, the majority, took the view that um, burdens of proof was a useful thing to, uh, to, to, to engage in and to, and to satisfy. Um, fifth, the clarity of representations. Uh, and what this means is that how, on a fair reading of the promise, it would have been reasonably understood by those to whom it was made. Uh, the Court of Appeal, in a case called Niazi, in England has said that what this imbibes is a rigorous standard. So the clarity of representations is subject to a rigorous standard. Unless you can show that rigorous standard being applied, the court really ought not to touch it. It's a matter for the government how they deal with that representation in question. Sixthly, there is a requirement of settled practice. You look to what had gone on before. It's not enough to point to statements at large made by a variety of people in a variety of fora, in a variety of disparate, uh, disparate circumstances. Um, there must be settled practice. Uh, and what that means is that you must look for a specific undertaking directed at a particular individual or group of individuals before you can say that there was that statement uh, subject to a rigorous standard of proof. Seventh, the number of beneficiaries normally on the whole must be small because a small number of beneficiaries uh, make it possible to say that in reality uh, there is an expectation that can be made good. Uh, the larger the number of beneficiaries, the more difficult it becomes and the more easy it is to say for the government to be able to say that um, there is a supervening public interest that has arisen since the making of the statement and what has transpired since now, allowing it to provide for an overriding public interest that will enable it to arrange from the uh, undertaking. Eighth, rather more difficult, the whole question of detrimental reliance. Uh, you've obviously got to rely upon the statement, but do you have to act to your detriment? And what the courts have said here is just that normally it's certainly right that you have to show that because if there's no hardship, there is no reason uh, why the government should not be able to change its mind. But having said that, there is no requirement for a monetary loss. And given that that is the case, the question of detriment will essentially be a question of fact rather than a question of law being imposed upon you. Ninth, obviously... A legitimate expectation cannot contradict a statute, because otherwise the promise is acting uh, contrary to law. So uh, it's got to be a lawful promise. Tenth, mistake. Sometimes uh, representations are made, which are made mistakenly by a government department. Well, if that's the case, then the claimant must show that the statements, statements were made in earnest, they were made correctly, and they were made so uh, as a matter of law. Uh, the claimant must show that those statements would be able to bind the government. Eleventh, the maker must be authorised in law to make the statements. So, plainly, one government department making the statements will not bind another government department, must be authorised to make that. Twelfth and lastly, my dozen points, is the whole question of what happens when you are in a field that is so, so huge that it's not really for the courts to be telling the government how it may make that decision. Central government, the point here is this, the central government must enjoy a wide discretion to change policies from time to time, uh, which uh, reflect the broader uh, conception of public interest. Constitutional governance allows for the liberty of the government to make changes in policy. And this is especially so where uh, a different political party takes over, 
from one which made those statements. Uh, it, that's why it's not appropriate to look at the content of political speeches made during election time, because people promise, you know, uh, heaven on earth, and uh, they're not going to be bound by that. So often, the delivery of a project promised, the scale, the duration, the ambition of it, is always going to be conditional upon the availability of finance and the requisite policy decision. Something very important to bear in mind. And the critical point here is this, that obviously this must be right in terms of constitutional law, because otherwise a predecessor government would be able to bind a successor government. It would be able to fetter the successor government's discretion, and that simply would be contrary to the very basics of constitutional law. So, that being so, the decision to grant a benefit is a decision vested in the decision maker, not vested in the court. All the court can do is simply look at the legality of the decision. Otherwise, the court is going behind the government decision in a macro political or macro economic sphere. So, those are the basics, and I'm glad uh, to say that I've managed to cover that in 10 minutes. So, let me take you to the first of my, my cases, the well known case of uh, Paponet, which I think very neatly describes the problems at hand. Now, this is the well-known case uh, which involves the Maxi uh, Taxi Association. I am, of course, mindful of the fact that um, as guests of the uh, Trinidad and Tobago Legal Network, we have been the beneficiaries of the uh, Maxi Taxi Association. They were kind enough to pick us up at the airport. They've been whisking us around uh, the city uh, at our asking every single day. I've taken that into account and so naturally, I am entirely biased in their favour uh, in terms of what I'm about to say. Uh, Papanet involved the Maxi Taxi uh, Association, uh, because back in um, uh, up to 1995, they operated routes two and three, uh, being based uh, um, in, uh, at, at the Broadway. And in 1995, what happened was this, that, I mean, they had control of their own affairs. They did not have to pay a fee to use the taxi stand at the Broadway. In 1995, the government proposed that they move, and they moved to Citygate in South Quay. Now, that area, City Quay, was controlled by a competitor organization, the Public Transport Service Corporation. And certainly it was the case that at all material times, the maxi tax operators regarded the PTSC uh, as their competitors. And so what naturally the Maxi Taxi Association asked of the government was this, that they would not be under the control of the PTSC, that they would not have to pay any dues, that a skywalk would be constructed to allow their passengers a pathway from the city centre to the city gate. And of course, uh, what then happened was this, uh, very quickly, uh, the government decided not to follow that through. In fact, what it did was in 1997, uh, regulations were passed uh, under the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act. And uh, Regulation 4 is particularly interesting because what this says is this, that on the payment of a fee of $100, uh, the PTSC will decide uh, once it is satisfied that uh, the applicant is a quote-unquote fit and proper person, to then, on the payment of the fee and on satisfaction, to issue them with a permit uh, in a manner set out in the schedule so that they have to pay for every exit, every time that they use this, this particular service. And so what they argue now is this, that uh, rather uh, deflated by this uh, change of uh, turn of events, uh, they bring a claim based upon legitimate expectations. The reason I go to this case is to highlight how ambivalent and tricky the whole situation is. Pretty much anything and everything I've said so far is open to dispute. I mean, all the basic principles I just set out uh, allow for a multitude of different views. And it's really a, 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 a tremendous sort of a arena for an astute lawyer to enter because you could argue it, quite frankly, either way, couldn't you? Here is what um, the Maxi Taxi Association argue. They say that they were given clear and unequivocal representations, which gave rise to a legitimate expectation. They say that they have a substantive benefit. They say that they were given to a defined group of people, namely the members of the association. They say that these were given with the aim of persuading them to agree to move from the Broadway to the city gate. And they say that the government acted 
in breach of the representations in a way that was unfair and amounted to an abuse of power. All the things that they say they have to do. Uh, the case ends up eventually in the Privy Council where uh, Lord Dyson uh, says this. He says, well, let's look at uh, what needs to be satisfied. Firstly, what is the requirement of a clear, unambiguous and devoid of relevant qualification uh, to be met? How is that to be met? And he says, well, as I've already said earlier on, that, you know, on a fair reading of the promise, it would have to be reasonably understood to those whom it was made that this is what it meant. And Lord Dyson says, well, look, if you look at the language of uh, regulation of 1997, management and control are ordinary English words. And management and control mean that they, the Maxi Tax Association, would have retained their management, would have retained their control. And there can be no doubt about this. He says that at paragraph 30, but he ends his paragraph 30 with the following words. He says, the fact that there might have been some uncertainty as to precisely what management entailed does not mean that the representations were not clear and unambiguous. They certainly uh, were uh, devoid of any relevant qualification. Now, you read that, and then you read a absolutely devastating dissenting judgment in the highest court of the realm by uh, Lord Brown, who says, no, it's precisely because, as Lord Dyson had said, the fact that there might have been some uncertainty as to precisely what the management entailed, it's precisely because of that, that there wasn't a clear and unambiguous statement made in the first place. So you can see straight away the difficulties you get into. Secondly, says Lord Dyson, is the government then, assuming that a representation had been made, entitled to frustrate the expectation that has reasonably arisen. And Lord Dyson says, well, this is a more difficult question. And he says, in recent years, the case law in England and Wales has grappled with this entire question of, is the public authority entitled to frustrate its substantive legitimate expectation? And for this, if you're a government body, this is what you've got to show. You have got to show the government must identify an overriding interest. In Papanet, says Lord Dyson, no overriding interest was identified. When the case went before the first judge, Judge uh, Warner J.A., she was unable to identify a particular overriding interest. And what uh, Lord Dyson says is that you have to show a sufficient public interest which will override the legitimate uh, expectation created, otherwise you are in difficulty. Uh, he then deals with the whole question of burdens again. He says, well, it's true that the initial burden lies with the, uh, to prove the legitimacy of the expectation, but thereafter it shifts, and the authority then has to show what the overriding interest was. They weren't able to do so, and so they are in trouble. The risk for the government, therefore, is this, and if you are the uh, government body, listen up, is that you must place material before the court uh, of sufficient public interest to override. Otherwise, you will lose. And if you're a claimant's lawyer, this is what you're gunning for. You're gunning for the fact that there hasn't been proper disclosure because in nine times out of ten, it's the government that's got that information. You, the claimant, haven't got it. So you make your, uh, uh, your uh, um, request to say, want disclosure. What exactly is, is this? And you don't leave it right at the last minute. And unless the government can cough up that information, they are really unable to show the uh, overriding interest. And the reason for this is, again, constitutionally utterly prim and proper. The principle, as the court said in Nadaraja, that good administration requires public authorities to be held to their promises would be undermined if the law did not insist that any failure or refusal to comply is objectively justified as a proportionate measure in the circumstances. So that's another way to look at these cases. Is the government's behavior proportionate? in the way that they're dealing with the citizenry. And, and it's disproportionate if it's unable to deal with the burden of proof on it, to provide the information that's required, uh, so and so forth. Uh, now, uh, what uh, then transpires is this, that uh, the court goes on to say, well, look, this entire business about the government being able to put information on the table to show why it's acted as it has is not a mere technical point, because it is only the authority which uh, uh, will know why it has gone back on its promise. And the authority is always better placed than the applicant to give the reasons. So they've got to show what the public interest is. That's a critical thing. It must, as one court said, articulate its reasons so that their propriety may be tested by the court. Now, sometimes, of course, it may be possible for the relevant overriding public interest, without disclosure, uh, to be gleaned 
to be discovered from the terms of the decision which is inconsistent with the promise given. But that will rarely be the case. In most cases, the government will have to tell you why it has reneged on what, what the changes be, what the overriding interest is. So you could say that the promise is only, this is something else that the government could do if it's not able to uh, disclose information. The government could say that the promise, give, assuming that it was given, and in um, uh, the uh, Clico case, it was accepted by council that the promise was given, it was accepted by council leading uh, for uh, the, uh, the government that um, uh, a legitimate expectation had been created. Uh, you could say that the promise is only for a limited period, for a specified period uh, or subject to conditions or for a reasonable period. And after that, it doesn't bind, it lapses. Again, if that's what you're going to argue, you, the government, have to, have to show that. Um, the, uh, where you have been given promises, good administration and elementary fairness does then require you to take into the fact that you did give the promise, because if you don't take that into account, your decision will again be uh, lacking in uh, proportionality. So this is how the government decides that, uh, uh, sorry, the court decides that um, in Papanet there was a legitimate exhortation and that the uh, government had uh, uh, erred at all fronts. Now, just lastly, what about uh, Lord Brown? Why does he feel that he's got to dissent in such a thunderous manner? Well, this is what he says. He says that, um, firstly, there was an affidavit which had been excluded uh, before the first judge, um, uh, Judge Ibrahim, albeit Ibrahim. But on appeal, the court appeal had allowed the affidavit of uh, Roger Israel. And Roger Israel's affidavit gave reasons for why it was that people were moved. He said, Quote, for the purposes of eradicating traffic congestion, illegal touting, and other undesirable activities. The mind boggles, make up your own mind. Secondly, he says that the PTC, uh, SCE, may have been uh, the main competitor, uh, and, uh, but the fact was that by that stage, 90% of the uh, uh, passenger clientele had already been taken up by the Maxi Taxi Association, and only 10% were in the hands of the PTSC. And although it was the case that the maxi taxi owners wanted to still retain control, no guarantee was given. No guarantee was given at all. So what Lord Brown is saying, that there wasn't even, you don't even get off the ground. There wasn't even a representation that could be said to be binding. And um, he then goes on in, in the strongest terms at paragraph 62 to say, were these assurances such as could be regarded as clear and ambiguous and devoid of relevant qualification, such as to commit the government to honour them on a lasting basis. Is it to be said that the association could, had they wish, have enforced the skywalk? Because remember, the skywalk was never built and it was never enforced. Um, why, one wonders, was there never a complaint made about this? Why was no complaint made about the failure to hand over management of the facility to the association three months later, six months later, or ever? Why was there no challenge to the 1997 regulations? Why indeed, he asks, was there no complaint ever made on the imposition of the user fee until nearly three years after it was introduced? He says, quote, none of this suggests to me that the association regarded itself as a beneficiary of a well nigh enforceable promise. So he then ends really by saying that what this is, is a quote unquote unmerited windfall for the association. Uh, at so great a cost to the long-suffering Trinidad taxpayers. That's all you people. So his view is that really this is just completely you know, off the wall. And he ends by saying, look, had the challenge been on a completely different footing, had the challenge been to the 1997 regulations, which imposed on the payment of a $100 uh, fee, the ascertainment of whether you were a fit and proper person before you could be issued the permit, had that been the challenge, he said he would have been altogether more uh, uh, sympathetic. But on the whole question of legitimate expectations, not so at all. Um, so there we have it. Now, just uh, very quickly, the, the, the other case that um, I'm not going to mention really in detail is the um, Clico case, which um, uh, really was a, just very, very quickly, I'm, I'm hesitant to deal with this simply because, uh, not because I actually appeared with Martineau and um, um, Eleanor uh, Honeywell, who's now since then gone on to the High Court. Uh, 
uh, but really because it's, it's quite inappropriate for me to say anything further given that the case is now poised to be heard by the Privy Council in London on the 15th of February. But essentially what I want to highlight is simply this, that here once again what you have are undertakings given in January 2009 to, to Clico, there's a, a, a member group of uh, uh, CLF which is the, the largest um, uh, private conglomerate in Trinidad and Tobago which uh, really uh, collapsed in, in 2009 and Clico then came to the government asking for some support. What happened was that uh, in January uh, a MOU was signed to provide support. The governor of the Bank of England then made statements including with uh, Mr. Dukrian, uh, the Minister of Finance and so what the statements were to the effect was that they, they would they're, they're, short-term investments would be fully honoured. But of course then what that happened was that you get the global financial crisis, the price of oil plummets, you know, much else is at stake and the change of government happens here in May 2010. In 2011 a revised plan is put in place. What's interesting to note here is again that the judge at first instance, Judge Charles, takes a very different view. Her view is that there was a legitimate expectation, the government wasn't able to provide uh, an overriding interest, evidence is not put before once again the, the court to show what it was that justified what they did. It then goes to appeal last year, almost exactly a year ago, June 2014, when uh, Chief Justice Archie takes a contrary view and he says no, that, that there wasn't a legitimate expectation and in any event there were macroeconomic policies here and so on and so forth. And so I shall say nothing f uh, no further on that. Just um, quickly to say that even for us back in England we are also having to deal with these very, very similar questions. A case that I just looked at before uh, setting out and I I must say that I uh, um, read it uh, uh, with one eye shut, like Ulysses uh, bound to the master of his ship, uh, very, very quickly indeed. A case called DM, I mean, it's, it's a case where uh, an asylum seeker comes in from Afghanistan, uh, makes an asylum application, invited for an interview, once doesn't attend, twice doesn't attend, eventually gets married, settles, and he then says, well, look, he's given discretion leave to remain. He says, uh, what about my asylum claim? Ah, I heard about a government policy the government announced, uh, a legacy policy where they said that long-standing cases on which there had been no decision, given that he'd never attended an interview for asylum, there'd be no decision with respect to his asylum claim, is that long-standing cases would be taken care of by grant of some kind of leave. And he said, well, look, what about me? You know, you made this, uh, this, this promise. And in the case of DM, which the Scottish Court of Session decided in 2014, what the court said here was this, and this is really the thing to, to bear in mind. Um, the court says the uh, Home Secretary statements and the legacy policy issued in July 2006 comes nowhere near satisfying the test of a promise that is clear, unambiguous, and devoid of relevant qualification. At best, and here is the, the word to remember if you're bringing, thinking about bringing these cases, at best it was aspirational. So there are aspirational statements that governments make without really thinking that they're going to be bound by them. So you've got to make that distinction. They do not constitute promises of any kind. Firstly here, because of the very large number of individual cases, and the cases here with respect to the number of asylum seekers were not even known to the British government. So that's how big the number is. Uh, they were in excess of 400,000, uh, says the court. Uh, and in view of the fact that there was some doubt as to when uh, the cases could be cleared up. Secondly, the time frame referred to was exceedingly long, five years. It was obvious that over such a period, circumstances would change, possibly radically. And of course, with uh, not just a financial crisis, but also the austerity policies kicking in, you know, we have uh, many other things to be thinking about. And thirdly, the policy in question involved a significant commitment of government resources. So again, um, Given uh, that that was the case, this case doesn't get off the ground. So there we have it. Whether I um, complete or not, I must, as I said at the outset, now finish, having consumed my uh, 20 minutes, or uh, as uh, Jane Austen's Mr. Bennett would say, uh, your services are no longer needed. You have delighted us long enough. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, just for that very incisive paper. Um, for, just to let you know as well, the TTLN will be placing on its website shortly after this conference the, um, the, the papers which are presented in their, in their original form. So that even if you're not able to take notes or you have not picked up all of it, you, you're not going to lose the benefit of that. I was intrigued by the contribution and, um, and certainly I was very keen to hear his analysis of the very robust dissenting judgment
of Justice Brown in the Papanet case. Um, and um, it, it underscored in my mind the importance of drafting and settling affidavits at an early stage. You would recall in his exposition, Professor just noted that Lord Brown said in effect that uh, the affidavit of uh, Roger Israel, which was filed by the respondent and which was excluded at first instance, was in fact reintroduced into the evidence and the Court of Appeal. And Justice Brown used that in effect to, to, to underscore that in fact there was a frustration of well, firstly, there may not have been a, any, any expectation, but even if it was, that that would itself have been frustrated because there was an overriding interest which was demonstrated by the respondent. Um, in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily agreeing with, with the Honorable uh, Justice Brown, but it does underscore for us as part of our continuing professional development as attorneys, and happily we have many of us here and students, the significance and importance of drafting and settling affidavits at an early stage. Because if you do that without understanding the nuances of the law and you, you, you do it badly or you do it wrong, the likelihood is that notwithstanding the merits or otherwise of your case, that you would die, have done an injustice to your client. So uh, I know as well that uh, Thomas Rowe is, is speaking after lunch on dissenting judgment. So no doubt he may make that point and perhaps even talk about Lord Brown's very robust judgment. Good. Well, we've had a very good start and we're continuing in terms of our program, just to let you know that we will have a comfort break at about 10.15 or so after Mr. Mirage's contribution and that we are um, pausing for lunch um, at about uh, 12 o'clock or so for an hour. A broader concept of state responsibility in public law, it is being presented jointly by Ms. Vijaya Miraj and Ms. Niala Badal. Vijaya, in fact, um, graduated from the London School of Economics with an LLB in law and from the University College in London with the LLM in, in public law. She is, in fact, a member of uh, RLM and Company and was admitted in 2004. She is extremely um, knowledgeable about public law matters and commercial matters and has appeared in numerous fora in, um, in the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Similarly, Ms. Badal is also a member of RLM and Company, more recent graduate in 2011, um, having um, been admitted to practice in 2011 following her graduation from the legal practice course, the LPC at Staffordshire Uni University and she's now um, in fact at RLM and Company and similarly is immersed in public and constitutional law but also has a, an interest in personal injuries and medical negligence claims. So ladies and gentlemen, perhaps you can join me in formally welcoming both Ms. Vijay Miraj and uh, Ms. Niala Badal who will present jointly a paper entitled A Broader Concept of State Responsibility in Public Law. And good morning everyone. My contribution this morning is in relation to the widening of state responsibility by the courts under the concept of a public authority. The decisions and actions of public authorities can be challenged under the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago and by way of judicial review. Under the Constitution, the court can give redress to a citizen where his or her constitutional rights under sections 4 and 5 have been infringed or are likely to be infringed by a public authority. Judicial review, on the other hand, is a means by which the decision-making process of a public authority can be reviewed by the courts. So then, what is a public authority? The Constitution does not define a public authority. In 1979, Lord Diplock and Maharaj the Attorney General No. 2 defined a public authority for the purposes of sections 4 and 5 of the Constitution to be the state or some other public authority endowed with coercive powers. He went on to widen that definition in Thornhill and the, and, and the Attorney General to include central authorities and any individual officer who exercised executive functions. It's been over 30 years since those decisions and the functions of the state have changed since then. They are no longer limited to matters affecting just law and order, defense and foreign relations. In fact, its functions now also include financial regulation, environmental protection, utility regulation, the regulation of monopolies and the fostering of markets. <clears throat> 
A number of its functions are now commercial in nature and also include the provision of services. In reality, there are a number of privately incorporated companies which do perform executive functions. In recent times, European law has broadened the concept of state responsibility in response to this change in nature of state functions. For instance, the European Court of Justice has held that a body such as a statutory hospital authority or a statutory, statutory gas corporation is an emanation of the state, so as to found state responsibility for its shortcomings in compliance with European directives. In 2013, the courts of Trinidad and Tobago followed this approach of broadening state responsibility under the concept of public authorities as it relates to the enforcement of human and fundamental rights under our constitution. In the recent case of Boxhill and the Attorney General, the Honorable Mr. Justice Abood, in a judgment described by the Privy Council as impressive, recognized this change in nature, nature of state functions and further extended the meaning of public authority as devised by Lord Diplock in 1979 by applying the test set out in the European Court of Justice in Foster and British Gas. The Court of Appeal of Trinidad and Tobago considered that this test was now appropriate and affirmed that in considering whether a relevant body is a public authority for the purposes of sections four and five of the Constitution, the question will now be, one, the authority is a body, whatever its legal form, which has been made responsible for providing a public service. Two, that public service is in the control of the state. And three, for that purpose, it has been provided with special powers beyond those which result from the normal rules applicable to relations between individuals. Barrow J.E. recognized that a body which performed a function which was governmental, governmental in nature could not escape the provisions of sections four and five of the Constitution, simply because it did not fall within one of the traditional functions of the state or legal forms of government, and that its decisions could be challenged before the courts if they infringed upon rights and freedoms of citizens. The Court of Appeal upheld that decision of Abuji, that the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, a body corporate established for the purposes of operating port services in Port of Spain and the Port of Scarborough, is in fact a public authority for the purposes of sections four and five of the Constitution. The approach, however, of the courts as to what is considered a public authority for the purposes of judicial review is rather different. In the past, the courts focused primarily on the source of the, of the power of the body in order to determine whether that body was amenable to judicial review. There was no dispute that a body created by statute could in fact be considered a public body. However, in light of the modern functions of the state, the courts have also now considered whether, also now consider whether the exercise of the power in question or performance of a duty involves a public element. For instance, in the English case of ex parte Datafin, the court held that a self-regulating voluntary takeover panel, which was neither founded on statute or common law powers, but exercising immense powers de facto, devising, amending, and interpreting the city code on takeovers and mergers, was in fact exercising public law functions. It was held that in determining whether the decisions of a particular body were subject to judicial review, the court was not confined to considering the source of that body's power and duties, but could also look to its nature. Accordingly, if the duty imposed on a body, whether expressly or by implication, was a public duty, and the body was exercising public law functions, the court had jurisdiction to entertain an application for judicial review of that body's decision. The issue was determined by our courts in the NH International Caribbean case and Udicott. The Court of Appeal held that Udicott, a limited liability company, duly incorporated to carry out government's urban development policy, was a public authority amenable to, ju to judicial review since the state was in effect acting through the agency of Udicott to design, finance, finance and construct the building. 
The state was either providing the funds or, ne or necessary government guarantees, the land belonged to the state, and all of Udicott's functions were carried out for the, for the benefits of the public or a section of the public. Recently also, Caribbean Airlines was considered to be a public body, as in the case of Hamilton and Caribbean Airlines. Um, Robin Mohammed J held that since the government was the majority shareholder in the airline and the airline was established to undertake commercial activities on behalf of the state, that it was a public body. TSTT, a telephone service provider, was considered a public authority by Bess J in Samaru and TSTT as he considered government to be in a position to exercise control of the service provider and it was supported with public funds. WASA, a water provider, was also treated as a public authority in Desmond Haynes and the and WASA. It would appear, however, that the courts of Trinidad and Tobago are not prepared to hold that a decision taken by a public authority, whatever its legal form, to enter into or determine commercial contracts or to supply goods and services could be the subject of judicial review in the absence of fraud, corruption or bad faith where there is no statutory underpinning for the decision taken. However, this divide between private and public law actions does not apply in an action brought pursuant to Section 14 of the Constitution. There is no requirement in claims under the Constitution for the act in question to be of a public law element. As Barrow J held in the Box Hill case, any act of discrimination will attract the sanction of the Constitution. No pattern of discrimination is required. A single act will suffice. The provisions of sections four and five themselves provide the basis of the complaint. They found the claim itself. That is a sufficient basis which a claimant may proceed. The fact that the act for which there is a complaint arises out of a contract will be of no relevance to the viability of a constitutional claim in those circumstances. The private law nature of the act, therefore, will not be the sole basis by which the notice of motion will be judged. The decision will turn on the facts and circumstances of the case. That is to say, the nature of the allegations and the nature of the act complained of and the evidence led in support of the motion. It is clear that the courts of Trinidad and Tobago have adopted an approach of broadening state responsibility under the concept of public authority in order to meet the evolving functions of the state. There is no fixed definition of public authority and the categories are not closed. As Lord Parker CJ said in Ex parte Lane, the system remains open-ended and new territory can be annexed to the judicial empire as opportunities offer. Thank you, I'll now pass you on to Ms. Nyala Badal. Thank you very much, Vijaya. Good morning, everyone. My contribution this morning focuses on the widening of state responsibility and accountability through the Freedom of Information Act, Chapter 22 of 02. The Freedom of Information Act became law on the 30th of August, 2001. This act embraces the concept that information collected and generated by government is a resource of the people, for the people, and is to be accessible as freely as possible by the people. It seeks to promote the principles of accountability, openness, transparency, and increased public participation. As Justice of Appeal Narayan stated in the case of Ashford Sankar and Public Service Commission, open quotes, the object of the Act is to make information freely accessible to the public with a view to promoting transparency and accountability in the decision-making of public authorities. It is an important piece of legislation in a post-colonial society in which bureaucrats have historically been reluctant to expose their decisions to the glare of public scrutiny. Freedom of information is also important in a society that is politically polarized along ethnic lines and in which appointment to public office and decisions involving the allocation of state resources are often the subject of speculation and mistrust. Against this historical and social background, the right to access information from public authorities must be jealously guarded and must not be allowed to be whittled down." End quote. 
an applicant can request the public authority for official documents pursuant to Section 13 of this Act. The public authority must notify an applicant of its decision whether to disclose the requested documents or to refuse its request no later than 30 days from the dates on which the request was made. If the public authority does not notify the applicant of its decision or indicates that it is refusing to provide the requested information within this stipulated 30 days, then it is open to the applicant to file a judicial review claim challenging the said authority's refusal to make a decision or its refusal to provide the requested information. This act is a good start, but it is only a start. In my contribution, I would highlight the position which the local courts of Trinidad and Tobago have recently adopted in respect of the implementation of the Freedom of Information Act and the widening of state duty of disclosure pursuant to the said act. Firstly, the courts have held that where a public authority makes a decision that requested documents are not to be disclosed, the public authority has a duty under section 23 subsection 1 of the act to notify the applicant of its reasons of its refusal. It is the duty of the public authority to provide all of its reasons upon which it has based its decision to refuse to disclose the requested information. The courts have determined that the public authority is not entitled to seek to rely on additional reasons for its refusal at a later stage if an applicant challenges its refusal by way of judicial review. In the case of Ashwood Sanka and Public Service Commission, Justice of Appeal was very clear in the court's interpretation of this. He states, the commission failed to comply with the clear provisions of the act to provide proper reasons for its refusal so as to enable the appellant to make an informed decision as to whether or not he would challenge the refusal by way of the ju judicial review. In these circumstances, it is clearly undesirable that the respondent should be permitted to provide new reasons or to add to or augment vague or insufficient reasons originally advanced for refusal of access. In my view, to do so will ultimately frustrate the clear purpose of the Act, which is to permit the public to access information unless refusal of access can be brought within one of the exceptions specifically set out in the Act and adequate and intelligible reasons are provided for such refusal." End quote. The courts over the years have been increasingly reluctant to receive evidence to supplement inadequate reasons where there is a statutory duty to provide reasons for a decision. Secondly, the courts have also known that they can review a decision of a public authority that a document is exempt. A public authority can refuse to disclose a document if it is an exempt document under Section 33 of the Act. For instance, under the Act, a document can be exempt if its premature disclosure would be contrary to public interest, if it would have an adverse effect on the economy, if it would be contrary to financial interest by giving an unreasonable disadvantage, if the information is of a competitor public authority, if it contains information from a third party, or if it would disclose instructions issued. Justice of Appeal Jamada, in the case of Caribbean Information Access Limited and the Honorable Minister of National Security, set out a test which a court ought to apply in reviewing the decision of a public authority that a document requested is exempt. He stated, Open quote. The exemptions are also to be approached in a careful and contextually sensitive manner. A delicate balancing of competing policy interests must be engaged. Thus, in my opinion, the appropriate test is one of reasonableness. It is, is it reasonable balancing the competing interests and in light of the explanations given and where necessary the evidence supplied to uphold the exceptions claimed? This is an objective test and the public authority must satisfy the court on the civil standard of likelihood." End quote. The courts have been clear that there is no presumption in favor of exemption from disclosure or of access to documents held by public authorities as per Justice of Appeal Jamada in the said case of Caribbean Information Access. Thirdly, Section 33 of the Act is another aspect of the Freedom of Information Act which the local courts have had the challenge of implementing 
in order to transform the culture of public agencies. Where a public authority considers a document to be exempt under the Act, Section 35 of the Act provides that, notwithstanding any law to the contrary, a public authority shall give access to an exempt document where there is reasonable evidence that significant abuse or authority or neglect in the performance of official duty or injustice to an individual or danger to the health and safety of an individual or of the public or unauthorized use of public funds has or is likely to occur. The public interest in Section 35 of the Act has been described by Justice Mosai in the High Court judgment of Ashford Sankar as a term embracing matters, among others, of standards of human conduct and of the functioning of government and government instrumentalities tacitly accepted and acknowledged to be for the good order of society and for the well-being of its members. The interest is therefore the interest of the public as distinct from the interest of an individual. The burden is on the public authority to show that the public interest in withholding the information is greater than the public interest in disclosure. The courts have held that a public authority has a duty to conduct the Section 35 overriding assessment and analysis to consider whether the documents requested, though exempt, should still have been disclosed and to have explained this in its written response to the request. This is succinctly stated by Justice of Appeal Jamada in the sad case of Caribbean Information Access, where he quotes, the section, the section 35 public interest override assessment and analysis must be undertaken by a public authority. It follows a decision that a document is exempt, end quote. The learned Justice of Appeal went on to state that, in my opinion, fairness, justice, in my opinion, fairness and justice require that in these judicial review proceedings and in the interest of good public administration, that these requests be remitted to the respondent for its reconsideration in light of Section 35 and the opinion of this court. End quote. In conclusion, it would seem to me that the courts of Trinidad and Tobago have interpreted the Act in a manner which promotes greater transparency and accountability by public authorities in their duty of disclosure. As I close off, I would like to end with a quote taken from a recent judgment of Justice Frank Sipasad in the High Court case of the, the Joint Council, is Joint Council Consultative, in which he stated as follows, open quote, it must always be in the public interest to ensure that the activities and projects undertaken by government are transparent and all attempts should be made so as to dispel any perception of misappropriation of public fund and or financial impropriety. After 51 years of independence, the society must demand transparency and legislative moves in that direction should be welcome and applauded. Thank you very much. The Caribbean Court of, of uh, Justice. Um, Ms. Miriam Samaru, Principal of the Hugh Wooding Law School, and uh, Ms. Leela Ramdi, Member of the Equal Opportunities Tribunal. Our next presenter is Mr. Peter Knox, Queen's Counsel. Mr. Knox is head of uh, three hair court and was called to the bar in 1983 and took silk in 2006. He specializes in a range of appellate work in the Privy Council, including constitutional cases, contract and public law matters, as well as, in fact, criminal cases, as in, in particularly as it relates to pro bono matters and capital appeals. He frequently appears in the Privy Council and is an extremely competent and, and able advocate in commercial law with substantial experience in litigation and advising in property disputes and of professional negligence claims, as well as matters special in banking, uh, disputes resolutions, uh, mortgages, matters involving commercial agency regulations and claims concerning um, investments. And he has a wide range of experience of obtaining and um, what I recall as uh, garnishy orders and freezing orders on an urgent basis in commercial disputes. He has also conducted substantial litigation in involving investments and solicitors negligence. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Peter Knox and he will be presenting his paper on an overview of recent Caribbean cases.
Almost exactly 800 years ago today, King John put his seal to what became known as the Grand Charter, or Magna Carta. So I thought I would talk today about recent Caribbean cases, about the separation of powers, but prefaced by some comments on Magna Carta. Now to gauge the importance of this document, I think it helpful to consider the immediate reaction of its great opponent, Pope Innocent III. Now Pope Innocent III, despite his name, was an intelligent, worldly, and apparently rather humorous man. He trained, it seems, as a lawyer, and perhaps like many lawyers, taking the view that attack is the best form of defence, he was responsible for launching three crusades. Uh, he was also, by virtue of recent events, which uh, are rather tangled, the ultimate lord, both temporal and spiritual, of England, not King John. You can imagine, therefore, his surprise when he found out that King John, without any authority, had gone and put his seal to this new charter on the 14th of June, 1215. He immediately issued a papal bull when he found out about it on the 24th of August, 1215. This noted first that the Charter had been entered into, quote, by force and by fear, which might have assailed even the most courageous of men, uh, with the clear implication, unlike King John. He then went on utterly to cancel the Charter and its pledges and its obligations, quote, so that neither now nor hereafter shall they be of any validity. But what is most interesting is why he saw this document as such a bad thing. I quote, we, not wishing to close our eyes to such audacious wickedness, whereby the Holy See is brought into contempt, the royal prerogative diminished, the English nation outraged, and the enterprise of the crusade gravely imperiled. Uh, he was planning yet another crusade. Uh, he then finished off. Now, lawyers and judges have often been accused by historians for unhistorically reading back into Magna Carta ideas representative of their own era, but alien to that of the barons and King John. But I think this particular point made by Pope Innocent just months after Magna Carta was entered into is its most significant and long-lasting feature even today. Quite simply, as Pope Innocent recognised, it provided for the diminution of the royal prerogative, or the royal discretion. Whatever the position might have been before, some things were now clearly a matter of right, not a matter of discretion. In other words, Magna Carta contained the first clear expression of the doctrine which we would now call the separation of powers. Most famously it did this uh, by restricting the king's power to withhold, sell or delay justice from his subjects. Now it seems that initially Magna Carta, albeit in revised forms, was seen as a central, indeed uncontroversial part of English law for a good 200 years or so. It then appears to have receded in significance for a while until the Stuart kings brought it back centre stage in the 17th century. In essence, they took the view that they ruled by divine right and that the monarchy was free from constitutional restrictions. Thus, although by now there was a House of Commons and a House of Lords, the Stuart kings had no objection to sacking judgments, uh, judges if they didn't like their judgments, or indeed imprisoning members of Parliament in the Tower of London if they didn't like what they said or did in the House of Commons. In the end, in 1689, after James II's flight to France and William III's invasion from Holland, the Bill of Rights was passed, which the English Bill of Rights was passed, which at last, in Article 9, protected MPs' freedom of speech in Parliament by ousting the jurisdiction of any court, any other court, to question it. And in 1701, a couple of years later, the Act of Settlement, passed under the same king, laid the foundation for judicial independence by providing that judges were to hold office as long as they did not misconduct themselves. Since then, I think it is fair to say that gradually uh, the executive's discretion has been brought in most areas under judicial control by the development of judicial review, in particular in the second half of the last century. Even the royal prerogative itself can in principle be reviewed by the courts if the nature of the subject matter is such as to allow it. That, of course, is the famous decision in the Civil Service Union's case in 1981 in the House of Lords, when Lord Diplock, to everyone's surprise, suddenly came down on the side of the Liberals. But just as the executive's power has diminished, so too, in that period, so too Parliament's power has on the, on the face of it increased. In classic constitutional theory, Parliament is free to pass such laws as it pleases. 
Of course, its freedom to do so is limited uh, to the extent that the Constitution itself provides in terms, as many do, and, and indeed as does the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, that no statute passed by Parliament can infringe one of the protected human rights and freedoms. In such a case, the Court simply looks at the uh, apparently infringing statute, asks if it does infringe the fundamental right, and upholds it, or sets it aside as it must. That's easy. But often the protection given by a constitution to human rights and freedoms is limited. For instance, it may provide that laws already in existence uh, when the constitution came into effect are to continue to have effect, notwithstanding any inconsistency with the human rights provisions in the constitution. In other words, it may contain what we lawyers call an existing laws clause. Or it may provide that the law can take away the human rights protection as long as it is passed with a certain majority, say three-fifths or two-thirds, as in, I think, the case of Section 13 in the Trinidadian Constitution. Or it may not even purport to protect any fundamental rights at all, such as, I think, the Constitution of the Cayman Islands. On the face of it, you might think that if the law that passed by Parliament cannot be struck down for inconsistency with the human rights provision, then it cannot be struck down at all. But you'd be wrong. The story starts in 1953 with the famous case from Ceylon, as it then was, Sri Lanka is now, Lionage and the Queen. In this case, special laws were passed by Parliament, the local Parliament in Ceylon, after a coup to widen the class of offences which could be tried without a jury, and to widen the scope of the, of the offence of waging war against the Queen, and to increase the range of penalties, and also, for good measure, to change the rules of evidence. Now, there was no fundamental rights clause in the Ceylon Constitution, but nonetheless the Privy Council struck down these laws on the basis that they were directed to the trial of particular prisoners who had taken part in the coup for a particular criminal offence, and that this therefore involved a usurpation by the legislature of the judicial powers. That, it was said, was inconsistent with the implicit intention of the Constitution. Nowhere spelled out expressly. Now, to similar effect, in 1977, in a case in Jamaica, Hines and the Queen, the Privy Council struck down a law which created a new court, called the Dunn Court, which had been set up by Parliament to hear specific offences of violence. Because, the Privy Council held, the judges to this court would not be appointed in accordance with the appointment procedures for judges set out in other parts of the Constitution. In other words, you can't have people who are really acting as judges but haven't been appointed in the way the Constitution provides. Now, in my view, neither of those decisions is particularly surprising. Indeed, in the first, the Lionage case, the Privy Council was careful not to state a point of great principle. They were rather hesitant. They obviously didn't like the look of the law. But in 2002, the Privy Council, in another case in Jamaica, called DPP and Mollison, considered an old statute which provided for juveniles to be detained during the Governor-General's pleasure rather than under the court's control. This was an existing law, it was the traditional way the common law had always dealt with juveniles, and was therefore saved uh, from challenge for inconsistency with the fundamental rights provision because Jamaica had a, an existing laws provision. But nonetheless, the Privy Council still struck that down. But in doing so, Lord Bingham said something which I think is very striking indeed and bears repetition. And he said this, Whatever overlap there may be under the constitutions on the Westminster model between the executive and legislative powers, the separation between the exercise of judicial powers on the one hand and legislative and executive powers on the other is total, or effectively so. Such separation, based on the rule of law, was recently described by Lord Stain as, quote, a characteristic feature of democracies, end of quote. I emphasise the word total there. There is a total separation. Now, this line of argument was taken a step further in 2007 in a case from, from, from Mauritius called Coirati. Now, in this case, new legislation taking away the grant of bail pending trial for certain drugs offences was passed by a constitutional amendment with a three-quarters majority. That being the majority necessary to introduce, under the Mauritian Constitution, a provision which derogated from the Constitution's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. In other words, Parliament thought we've done the necessary. We've got the necessary majority to get that one through. Supreme Court and Privy Council wasn't having any of it. Section 1 of the Constitution of Mauritius provides that Mauritius shall be a democratic state. And this provision, that provision, 
could be altered only after a referendum and a unanimous vote by all members of the House of Assembly, not, in other words, by a mere three-quarters majority. Now, repeating Lord Bingham's dictum, the Privy Council held that the usurpation of the court's role over the grant of bail was inconsistent with the very nature of democratic state, and it therefore simply couldn't happen, in effect, as long as Mauritius remains a democracy. These last two cases, I think, are very strong cases indeed, not least because it's very rare to come across a proposition of law expressed in such absolute terms, namely the separation of powers is total, or effectively so. This brings me now to three recent cases from the Caribbean which have considered the do the, this option. The first is one which I'm sure is well known to all of you, the great Section 34 case of Steve and Ish, as I understand it's called, or more properly, Ferguson as the, the, the state. Now, in this case, as you no doubt know, the government of Trinidad and Tobago in, I think, September 2012, brought into force by proclamation Section 34 of an act which I'm reliably informed is called the Administration of Justice and Dicable Proceedings Act. I have to admit, I asked about five, ten people here what the name of that act was. No one was able to answer it until someone kindly went online to find the name for me. Anyway, Section 34 had the effect of giving those accused of very many serious crimes, including corruption and the like, the right to apply to the court to be discharged if more than ten years had passed since the crimes had been committed, subject to certain exceptions. Uh, there was immediately public uproar and some public suspicion, I think it's fair to say, and 12 days later, Parliament passed an Amendment Act to repeal and to reverse the effect of Section 34, with the result that all those who thought they had the benefit of this new 10-year limitation provision had now lost it again and could be prosecuted after all. This, in turn, prompted an attack on the Amendment Act by those who thought they had the benefit of the limitation period and who had indeed, rather quickly off the mark, already got round to applying to the courts to be discharged from the criminal offences they'd been charged with, including Mr Ferguson and others accused of, cor others accused of corruption in relation to the Piarco airport contracts uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Now, one of the central attacks made by uh, Mr Ferguson and his uh, co-applicants uh, uh, was um, on the amending uh, legislation was that it infringed the principle of the separation of powers. Now, this was tactically a very important argument in the case, because the amending legislation had been passed with a three-fifths majority, need I understand, in the House of Representatives unanimously. Uh, and so, by virtue of Section 13 of the Constitution, it couldn't be attacked for inconsistency with the fundamental right to due process, protected in Chapter 2 two of the Constitution, unless it was shown not to be reasonably justifiable in a society that has a proper respect for the rights and freedoms of the individual. That is never such an easy thing to show. That is why it was important for the applicants to try to rely on the separation of powers principle instead. The argument went that by reversing Section 34, Parliament was illegitimately interfering in the court process. That is to say, the process of applying for a discharge granted by Section 34 of the previous Act. Now, both the judge, Madam Justice Dean Armourall, and the Court of Appeal, uh, Mr Justice of Appeal Mendonca, Jamadar and Smith, uh, uh, rejected that argument. In fairly stinging terms, I think it's fair to say. Uh, in essence, they held that the amending Act had been passed simply to correct a manifest flaw maybe oversight in the previous legislation, and that it was not seeking to prejudge or direct the outcome of criminal charges, but rather simply seeking to restore the position to what it had been and to enable a fair trial to take place in accordance with the pre-existing rules. That matter is now under appeal to the Privy Council, and the appellants are contending that the judgments below missed the point which is that, amending that the amending legislation interfered retrospectively with their applications to the court to be discharged under Section 34. Now, I have been instructed to act on behalf of the state in that appeal, and so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to say anything more about the case other than to say that the Court of Appeal is plainly right and the appellants plainly wrong. <laughs> uh, the, second, the second recent case that discusses uh, this doctrine of the separation of powers is the Attorney General of Belize against uh, Zuniga, a decision of the Caribbean Court of Justice on an appeal from Belize, decided uh, in January last year. Now, in this case, legislation was introduced in Belize to create the offence of knowingly disobeying or failing to comply with uh, an injunction, in particular an anti-arbitration injunction. 
And further, the legislation prescribed very severe penalties for this offence, including mandatory minimum penalties. Uh, this would apply, this legislation must apply not only to the parties themselves who tried to uh, breach the legislation, but also to their advisers. Now, what happened, what, what had happened, was that an arbitration award had been made against the government of Belize, ordering it to pay damages, I think, of about 38.5 million Belize dollars for breach of contract. The government, however, obtained an interim injunction in Belize, I think, to restrain the successful uh, claimants from seeking to enforce the award against it. One of the claimants, uh, called Dunkeld, however, ignored that order and proceeded in any event to try to enforce the award, not in Belize, but in another jurisdiction. Hence, the act that I've just mentioned was passed, creating the offence uh, and prescribing the minimum penalties. Now, in the end, the act was challenged by a group of advisers who thought they might be affected by it, known as the Zuniga Group. They feared that they might be charged under the act. They contended that the legislation was introduced specifically to target members of their group in their recourse to international arbitration and to get remedies under it, and also, they said, because it introduced a special regime for the prosecution and punishment of a breach of an anti-arbitration injunction at the complete discretion of the executive. Uh, the Caribbean Court of Justice rejected these arguments. In the main judgment given by Mr. Justice of Appeal Saunders, Nelson and Hayton, uh, it said the following, and I quote, because it's a very important passage, which I think uh, can be taken more or less to be the most uh, um, authoritative uh, exposition now of the doctrine of separation of powers. Quote, legislation prompted by the acts of a particular individual or group, accompanied by the introduction of steep mandatory penalties and providing for rules to be made by the Attorney General, might raise a red flag especially where the government has or may have an interest at stake. Undoubtedly it did in that case. Uh, but even if present, these indicia, indicia by themselves alone do not necessarily establish that the separation of powers doctrine is compromised. To offend the doctrine, it must be shown that the legislature is undermining the decisional authority or independence of the judicial branch by compromising judicial discretion. The court's ability to address legal principles in a pending case, i.e. its adjudicative process, must be negatively impacted so that it can truly be said that the legislature, in order to guarantee a particular outcome, is prescribing or directing or constraining the court in its application or interpretation of those principles. And then they continue, the litigant must be protected from a situation where he or she has to contend in court with both the opposing side and the interference of the legislature seeking in the midst of proceedings to direct the judge as to the outcome of the contest. End of quote. Accordingly, uh, the, the court held, although the minimum penalties were on other grounds objectionable, there was no question here of an infringement of the separation of powers doctrine. This is because there was no direction in the legislation to the judiciary as to how to exercise its new powers granted by the legislation. The court also held this, so far as material, that although the act may have been passed with the Zuniga group in mind, and indeed others specifically in mind, that wasn't enough in any event to make the legislation ad hominem, as the phrase goes, because it wasn't expressed to apply to specific individuals, or indeed arbitrations, but was expressed in general terms. The court concluded, subject to the Constitution, Parliament was at liberty to exercise its legislative power so as to abrogate existing rights and liabilities which would otherwise be subject to judicial determination. That, it held, was not the same thing as telling the court what to do. So in other words, you can remove a right, but you can't leave a right in place and then tell the court how to adjudicate upon it. Quite a fine distinction. The third case I wanted to mention, third and last, is a case from uh, uh, St. Kitts, a decision this year of the Privy Council uh, concerning the recent election there, called Brantley and Others and the Boundaries Commission. This time, a decision on the separation of powers which went the other way. And briefly, the facts were this. The Constitution of St. Kitts and Nevis provides for an electoral boundaries commission. On the 16th of January this year, this commission, by a 3-2 majority, abruptly decided to recommend a change to the, electro, uh, to the electoral boundaries in St. Kitts and Nevis. Now, the effect, of the, recommend, uh, the, the effect of the recommended change, surprise, surprise, would be to uh, mean that on the past voting patterns, the current government would sweep all 11 seats, sweep up all 11 seats in St. Kitts. 
uh, the government decided to call an emergency meeting of the National Assembly, that's its local parliament, on the same afternoon as the um, Electoral Commission's decision and gave last-minute notice to the opposition MPs about this emergency meeting, some of whom managed to turn up after the debate had already started and who need to say objected to the whole procedure. And there's a wonderful moment in Hansard where it reports that the cameras turn towards the opposition benches and no one is there at first. Uh, and then when someone does eventually turn up, they turn to him and they turn to the government benches where all the members of the government are laughing. Uh, of course, the objection was, how on earth could this possibly be an emergency? We're just talking here about changing boundaries. The debate continued and eventually the National Assembly approved the new boundaries and that same evening, the Governor-General immediately signed a proclamation purporting to bring the new boundaries into effect. Now, the reason why the Government acted so quickly was that Section 50, Subsection 7 of the Constitution uh, provided that once new boundaries had been proclaimed by the Governor-General, then there could be no challenge to the Boundary Commission's recommendations. Whereas before the proclamation was made, you could challenge the new proposed boundaries by judicial review under section 96 of the Constitution. So it was terribly important, terribly important from the government's point of view, to get this legislation pushed through as quickly as possible before anyone could get to court to challenge it. That was what was really going on. And that way, of course, they could guarantee winning the next election too. Now, unfortunately for the government, on the same evening, uh, 16th of January 2015, uh, after the proclamation had been signed by the Governor-General, but before it was published in the local gazette a few days later, representatives of the opposition parties got an injunction from the High Court in St Kitts against the Governor-General, ordering him not to make the injunction, and it was then served on him. The government then applied to set that injunction aside. They said it was all far too late. It was all totally irrelevant, because by the time the injunction had been served, the proclamation had been signed, because, and that meant the proclamation had been made. Therefore, the injunction was too late. Therefore, it was useless. Therefore, the new boundaries had come into force. Therefore, the whole thing was immune from challenge. Therefore, they must apply to the next election, which, of course, by now had been declared to be uh, held uh, on the 16th of February, 2015. Now, that argument succeeded at first, in, at first instance in St Kitts and in the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal, but uh, the Privy Council rejected it, holding that the proclamation had not been made until it had been gazetted after the making of the injunction. It followed, therefore, that as the proclamation had been made or completed only after the injunction, it was of no effect. Therefore, the election had to be held on the old boundaries, not the new boundaries. But the Privy Council went on to deal with the point, the other point that was made by the opposition, that anyway, the way the government had tried to introduce the new legislation was a deliberate attempt to deprive the opposition parties of the opportunity to mount a legal challenge to the Electoral Commission's report under Section 96 of the Constitution. And the Privy Council concluded, and I quote, at least there was, there was at least a strongly arguable case that a deliberate attempt by one branch of government in the control of the governing party to prevent individuals from obtaining access to the High Court for constitutional adjudication under Section 96 of the Constitution would be unconstitutional as it would deny the protection of the law contrary to Section 3A of the Constitution. It was therefore strongly arguable that the proclamation was on that other ground unconstitutional in any event and therefore void. Now, what does one draw from the, these last three cases? Very briefly, I think one can make the following three propositions. First, Parliament is entitled to change the law in such a way as to take away existing rights. That does not amount to a breach of the separation of powers principle. Parliament is perfectly entitled to do that, even if you might think they're rather fundamental rights. You might have protection under the fundamental rights clauses, you won't have protection under the separation of powers doctrine. Second, Parliament is not entitled to leave an existing law and existing rights in place, but then tell the court how to adjudicate on those rights. That does amount to a breach of the doctrine of separation of powers. Um, uh, and even if, even if it does not amount to a breach of the fundamental rights provisions. Thirdly, Parliament is not entitled to use its own process in such a way that individuals cannot get to court in time to assert their existing right to challenge proposed new legislation uh, which is recognised by the Constitution itself. 
Those, I think, are the three principles one can draw uh, from that. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in fact, many of you um, are taking notes, and I just want to also let you know that we have a very wide listenership, in fact, a global listenership, because our broadcasts are being carried live by I-95.5, Power 102 um, radio stations, and later on this afternoon, the panel discussions are being broadcasted by Heritage Radio 101.1. These proceedings are also being carried by CNC3. And therefore, our global audience will have the benefit of hearing from our next speaker, Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Miraj, and his paper is entitled The Supreme Court um, on, as Guardians of the Constitution. Ms. Miraj needs no introduction, but notwithstanding that, for those of you who may not be familiar with him, he was called to the bar in 1967 and took silk in 1996. His considerable experience in practicing as a practicing attorney at law in the Caribbean Commonwealth and has also practiced extensively before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. He has appeared in numerous cases in public um, and constitutional law and in fact has seen the law from all angles as a litigant, as a lawyer, as attorney general and I dare say as a, as a prisoner because some of you may recall that in 1976 he was briefly imprisoned um, for contempt of court. Um, a matter which in fact prompted Attorney General um, A. Mirajan versus Attorney General in several forms, and also a book, Barrister Behind Bars, which in fact is in our library, the Hewitting Law School Library. Some of you should read it. Good. Mr. Miraj um, has also um, been responsible for the development of the law and, um, and in fact has appeared in numerous cases, some of which we cited, the Papanet case this morning. Um, as well as the Oswald Allen and others case, which came out very, very recently. We also have the Lennox Phillip case, um, the Gayadine, Mitchell, many, many of them. I um, hope he gives us an opportunity to have a discussion with him and perhaps they upgrade his own views in relation to those matters. Mr. Mirage served as Attorney General of our dear Republic between 1996 to 2001. And during his tenure in office, and this is something he's very proud of, and I think with the fullness of time, we now appreciate that. He was responsible for an aggressive law reform program, which included the Freedom of Information Act, which um, we talked about earlier this morning, as well as the Equal Opportunity Act. Um, and Mr. Ambien from the Equal Opportunity Commission is here. And of course, the Judicial Review Act, uh, number 60 of 2000. And if I can just add this personal contribution in terms of the Judicial Review Amendment Act, those of you who have read it may well agree with me that it is an incisive and perhaps um, an extremely provocative extension of the law as it relates to public law and has codified for the first time in many Commonwealth jurisdictions many of the private law elements which in fact makes judicial review not only a model but in fact a very practical and workable remedy. And for that, certainly on behalf of generations of constitutional lawyers, Ms. Maraj, I thank you. I thank you for that piece of legislation. So let us invite Mr. Mirage to make his contribution on, in respect of the Constitution. Good morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Bicessa. Um, may I first say that I am very privileged to be here, to be with you, to be able to share these thoughts with you. And I would like to congratulate um, the members of Hare Court and all those who have participated in Trinidad and Tobago to make this possible. I think it is very important for lawyers to have continuing legal education, and I think it's also important for judges to have com continuing judicial education, because without that it is not possible for the law to be developed to its maximum. Um, in speaking today, I want to take it from a different angle. I want to take it from the angle that, as you would have heard this morning, um, the law has been developed, although we know what the law is, what the Constitution says, but the law has been developed, and it depends upon lawyers, it depends upon judges, and it depends upon litigants and members of the public to develop the law. And in that context, I would like to um, discuss the challenges which the legal profession face in the quest to develop the law, and taking that in the context of the Supreme Court as a guardian of the Constitution of the countries of the Commonwealth of the Commonwealth Caribbean.
I know that I'm addressing a lot of law students who are going to be potential lawyers, and I think I would like to take this opportunity of sharing some of my experiences with them so that it might inspire and motivate them um, to be able to take steps to have the law developed. And sitting here, I heard some of the cases like Box Hill, Papanet, um, even Maharaj, and, and the Attorney General number two. And um, the judges would not be able to decide cases and to pronounce on the law unless you have the cases before them. And therefore, uh, lawyers have to understand that they have to have a passion for justice in order to take some of these matters forward. Um, we have in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean a, a situation in which since independence the Constitution made the Supreme Court the guardian of the Constitution. A new remedy was created by the Constitution to give to every individual the right to approach the High Court if that individual believes that his or her right was being infringed or is likely to be infringed or have, has been infringed. And the court is given the power, omnipotent power in my view, to grant redress. So one sees that whether it is the legislative arm of the state or the judicial arm of the state or the executive arm of the state, if any citizen believes, any person believes that the state in whichever arm is violating his or her right, that individual is entitled to approach the court. Now the individual would need lawyers, would need um, in order to go to court, but that individual would be able to approach the court to have the court declare rights infringed. Now taking for example Maharaj and the Attorney General, number two, we, would, we may not have had the right of a litigant to recognize in that case unless there was a decision to go forward after the imprisonment of the barrister in 1975. The barrister had to decide to fight the system and he needed lawyers to assist him to fight that system. If the barrister did not get assistance from lawyers in the United Kingdom to take the matter to the Privy Council, lawyers in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean, and I don't know if Sir Fenton Ramsohoy is here, oh yeah, he's sitting here, we would not have been able to take that case. So lawyers have a duty to be able to take cases in order to challenge a system. And therefore, Maharaj and Attorney General number two, if, if I may say so, it's a landmark case, but it shows that not even the judicial arm of the state can violate the Constitution and a citizen will get no redress. The judge is not liable, but the state is liable. So, um, there, is a, there is a great jurist um, who I um, read from time to time. He was um, the Chief Justice of India, Bhagwati. Um, uh, when I was Attorney General, I brought him to Trinidad and Tobago and he assisted in, in, in drafting, in helping us to draft that Judicial Review Act. And you would see from some of the decisions of the Supreme Court of India, you would see that the lawyers take the matters to court and the Indian Supreme Court has held that you could only write a letter. And as long as the court is aware of a violation of a fundamental right, the court will perform its duty to determine whether the right is being infringed. Without any legislation, the court can appoint assessors, investigators, get a report, serve it on the state, and you can have a decision. And when you read some of the decisions of the Indian Supreme Court, you would see how proactive and dynamic the judiciary has been in ensuring that the Constitution is a living instrument. Because the Constitution must not only speak of justice, it must deliver justice. Chief Justice Bhagwati said, law is not like an antique to be taken down, dusted, admired, and put back on the shelf. It is rather like a vigorous tree 
which has its roots in history, but takes on new grafts, put on new sprouts, and occasionally drops dead wood. It is a dynamic instrument fashioned by society for the purpose of achieving harmonious adjustment of human relations by eliminating social tensions and conflicts, and it must therefore change with the changing political, social, and economic conditions in society. So when we talk about cases and when we talk about developing the law, we as lawyers have a duty to the public in order to assist the public and assist the courts in developing the law. And that is how the system, in my view, must work. I believe the legal profession should not be a profession which should merely be concerned with going to chambers, going to the law courts, dealing with cases, and earning a living. I believe the lawyers have to give back something to society, and therefore they should be involved in the society. They should work with communities, and they should take steps to bring before the courts matters which the judiciary should determine in order to vindicate the rights under the Constitution of the peoples of the Caribbean. Law must be constantly on the move, adapting itself to changing society and not lag behind. Now, there is a case in Trinidad and Tobago recently which um, would in effect show how important it is for the courts in dealing with the Constitution to be able to be very liberal in permitting public spirited individuals and groups to bring before the courts matters which involve the violation of the Constitution. There is a, a case which was decided in the High Court and the Court of Appeal and it is now before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. The name of the case is John Reginald Dumas versus the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. And let me briefly tell you what that case is about. I think most of the people in Trinidad and Tobago know that Mr. Dumas is a recognized public spirited individual. He writes um, a lot on the newspapers, but he was a distinguished public servant. And Mr. Dumas, decided that what His Excellency the President did in appointing two members of the Commission was wrong. He thought that the President did not comply with Section 122.3 of the Constitution in making two appointments to the Police Service Commission. He felt that the appointments were illegal. He wrote about it. He wrote the Attorney General. He pointed out matters to His Excellency the President and there was no action. So what did he do? He decided to file a claim. He filed a fixed date claim in the High Court asking for the High Court to interpret the Constitution to declare that what was being done was illegal. He said a police service commission is an important authority in the country and you cannot have a police service commission operating illegally. The police service commission is responsible for appointing police officers, promoting police officers, transferring police officers. So he went to the court. So we went to the high court and the high court upheld the submission of the attorney general that the court had no jurisdiction. And the court had no jurisdiction because according to the points made by the attorney general, that it's only if a citizen right is violated under section 14 of the Constitution and he can show that his right is directly violated, he can approach the High Court to get redress for a constitutional violation. So what the High Court was saying, that even if there are violations of the Constitution by top public officials, including the head of state, and your right is not directly violated under section 14, the Supreme Court is impotent to redress the situation. The constitutional violation must continue. Now, as a lawyer, I felt that that was unacceptable. I felt that there was no way the Constitution can function in a country 
in which you can have violations of the constitution and the court which is the guardian of the constitution is impotent to deal with it so we appeal to the court of appeal and we were successful the court of appeal justice of appeal jamada justice of appeal smith and justice of appeal barrow said they were there nothing of that a citizen has local standi to make the claim because the citizen has a legitimate interest in upholding the constitution and the rule of law and the court has an important role as a guardian of the constitution and the court must uphold the constitution and the rule of law as a matter of fact justice of appeal jamada held that the court was recognized as a guardian of the constitution and held that it was the duty and responsibility of the supreme court was to ensure that the constitution and the rule of law were upheld in trinidad and tobago now if mr dumas did not have the determination and the passion to take this matter to the court we would not have had the law recognize that a public spirited individual if there is a violation of the constitution can approach the court in order to have that issue determined and this matter the matter of uh, john reginald dumas i must pay tribute to mr carl hudson phillips he was the person who decided that he was going to take this matter to the court for mr dumas and unfortunately um, i had to take it over because of his sad um, death so one sees the importance that litigants play in developing the law in ensuring that the courts recognize the rights of the individual and to ensure that the constitution is not violated um, i think there is one case that i want to talk about again and that is a case um, referred to by mr knox and um, um, that is a case I have a lot of interest in because I see that there's a possibility for it's, a, it's an opening of the gates for the law to be developed in which a government cannot use its majority in parliament to rush through legislation in such a way or rush through um, decisions in such a way to deny access to the courts because it's a denial of the protection of the law and in Trinidad and Tobago at this time it can be very relevant because as you would know the government had introduced a runoff legislation to in order to change the rules for the general election the upcoming general elections that measure had a lot of criticism and the bill was was debated but it was not proceeded with and more than eight months have passed and recently the government has stated that it is going to go ahead with the bill although the parliament comes to an end in a few days time and general elections are due within 90 days after the parliament is dissolved which must be dissolved in a few days time so the the objections to the bill were no consultation that you cannot change the rules of election just before an election and although the bill seemed that you can pass with a simple majority there are important issues which you cannot change just before an, an election so i think this case is important because what the case decided was that there's a strongly there's a strong arguable case and, and i just want to um, I know Mr. N Mr. Knox referred to it, but I think since it's a very topical event in Trinidad and Tobago, um, I, I think law students would like to look at this too, and lawyers would like to look at it. In the board's view, there is at least a strongly arguable case that a deliberate attempt m made by one branch of the government, control of the governing party, to prevent individuals from obtaining access to the high court for constitutional adjudication so very interesting in the development of the law it may be that the supreme court of trinidad and tobago may have to determine as the guardian of the constitution as to whether a government 
can, on the eve of a general election, use its majority to pass a law in Parliament when you will have a restricted period for a litigant challenging the proceedings in the court, a right that the litigant would have from the High Court to the right of appeal to the Privy Council. In conclusion, there is one other case that I was involved in. There is one case that I was involved in and which involved um, um, a former commissioner of police from St. Vincent. The name of the case is Toussaint and the Attorney General. That was a case in which the Prime Minister Gonzalez um, went to the Parliament and he made a speech. And in that speech, he basically gave um, an attack on the former Commissioner of Police, made statements which showed that there was some political venom by him against the, commission of, the former Commissioner of Police on the basis that it was his view that the former Commissioner of Police supported the previous administration. But at the same time, the government decided to acquire Mr. Toussaint's land for what he said was a public purpose. And the public purpose given in the notice in the Gazette was a learning resource center. So Mr. Toussaint filed a constitutional claim. And he filed a constitutional claim saying that this was not a genuine acquisition of the land. It was a sham. It, it, was, not, it was for a political purpose, not for a public purpose. So Mr. Toussaint applied to the court for the court to permit him to use the statements made by Mr. Toussaint, uh, sorry, by Mr. Gonzalez in the court in order to show the court that this acquisition was not for a public purpose. The courts uh, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the, and, the, and the appeal court ruled in favor of Mr. Gonzalez. The matter went to the Privy Council and the Privy Council said no. Mr. Tuse was entitled, which notwithstanding parliamentary privilege, etc., was entitled to use these statements in order to show the motive for the acquisition. And it ruled also that although the act in St. Vincent stated that the speaker had to give permission for such um, matters to be used in a court of law, that act which gave the speaker those powers must be construed with such modifications as to give effect to the Constitution. So one sees the importance of the litigant and the importance of lawyers and the importance of judges recognizing that the court is the guardian of the Constitution. Mr. Tuse subsequently won his claim. He won his claim for damages and he has been awarded substantial sum of damages for the wrongful acquisition of his property. So in conclusion, may I say that the Supreme Court is the guardian of the Constitution. But the Supreme Court would not be able to perform that role effectively unless members of the public are encouraged by decisions to take matters before the courts when the constitutions are violated. And also the, the, also the court would not be able to perform that function effectively unless there is continuing legal and judicial education for all members of the legal profession. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mirage. And, and those of us who witnessed the presentation would not have no doubt that the passion and zeal that he espouses is a very real and uh, it actually belies the often felt thoughts that law is a very sterile thing, but in fact it's quite the opposite. The it's so dynamic, uh, the enthusiasm that is generated from being in this room and, and hearing that would certainly underscore, I think, the zeal and passion that some of our... The, that the ILP, the MSJ and the other political parties would split their votes. So therefore they want to be able to prevent that. And so therefore that is why the legislation is not for the peace, order, and good government of Trinidad and Tobago as the Constitution requires. The legislation is to try to keep the UNC and the partnership government in power. And it's for political purpose and therefore it's illegal. It's a denial of the protection of the law.
to oh, yes, them? certainly, certainly. If the opposition parties want me to assist them, we can put a team of lawyers together and we'll be able to, with a combination of a team in Trinidad and Tobago and a team in London, and we'll be able to have it um, dealt with. Okay, Ms. Maraj, excuse. One last question. What could happen between now and uh, before the des um, dissolving of Parliament? What could be the play -off? In the Parliament? Yes. Well, the Parliament is passing a lot of laws which are, are not properly, uh, there are no proper consultation. And um, uh, although the government has the majority, some of those laws uh, may not be able to be properly tested later. Um, I could tell you about the law with, with respect to squatters. Um, they're misleading the population. A certificate of title does not give the squatter any right to land. As a matter of fact, it's only a temporary measure. And the government, after the elections that they have done with other matters, can change the, uh, the policy. Um, so really and truly, that is an attempt to fool 60,000 squatters in Trinidad and Tobago for them to believe that they're getting land when in truth and in fact their decisions of the courts in Trinidad and Tobago in which a certificate of comfort does not give you a right or a legitimate expectation to get any land. So what, so what does it give uh, these squatters? It just gives the squatter uh, the, the, the peace that f for a period of time um, no one will come to demolish their homes. That was the purpose of it. As a matter of fact, when I was Attorney General, the certificate of comfort was introduced by the then Minister of Housing. And the whole purpose of it was to put their mind at ease that until um, applications are made to the Land Settlement Agency, and if it is that it is possible to assign them to any land, they, their houses would not be broken down. Okay, back to the runoff bill. Yeah. Um, do you believe that this, this eight-month delay, I'll bring it right on the eve of this, the dissolution of Parliament, do you believe it's deliberate on the part of the government? Well, I think the government was thinking not to proceed with the bill, and they were probably thinking that they would have strike a deal with probably uh, the MSG or the ILP. And I think that they saw, they now see that a deal is not possible, um, and therefore I think that has prompted them to decide to bring it back. Do you think that people should stand up against this bill? Well, with, the, with, the, with the government using their majority to pass it? I bill? think everyone in Trinidad and Tobago, including members of the partnership, um, the electorate should stand up against it because this is in effect um, telling the country that a government can use an election for political purposes and can use the parliament to promote a political party. Now the prime minister said what is wrong in uh, using the parliament for that purpose? Well that, that in law, that in law is criminal. That is misconduct in public office. The parliament is to be used to pass laws for the peace, order, and good government of Trinidad and Tobago, not for the prime minister to pass a law so that she would get more votes, directly that she would get more votes. This is a kind of law that you didn't have any public consultation with. You had no consultation. You just came with it out of the dark and come just to pass it to satisfy 60,000 squatters on state land. Do you think that the election could be delayed by all of this? No, no, no. I I the election cannot be delayed. Um, under the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, the Parliament must be dissolved on that, um, on that date in June. And within 90 days, the general election must be called. Um, the only thing to prevent a general election in Trinidad and Tobago is a state of emergency. And there is no state of emergency. And this partnership government is not well noted for creating a genuine state of emergency. So the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago requires the Prime Minister to call a date for the election. She could keep it as long as she wants, but she has to call that date in a short while, and she has to face the polls. I know there may be anxiety and fears by governments which believe that they may lose, but the Constitution and the law provide that. They have to do it. Switching gears, we want to get a little bit about Mr. Jack Warner. How do you feel about this whole fiasco that has unfolded? Well, there's the latest allegations from the Egyptian government that, they, yes. that he um, asked them for a bribe. And that they're not, they're not bringing that. Well, you know, extradition proceedings. I was the Attorney General when the extradition treaties were negotiated between the United States of America, Britain, and England. And as a matter of fact, the Secretary of State, Mr. Warren, came to Trinidad and Tobago to sign that extradition treaty. In negotiating that treaty, it is recognized 
that the Americans and the British and the Canadians in any extradition request has to recognize that there is a presumption of innocence and there is due process of law. So the government would have to produce evidence, evidence that can be um, accepted in a court of law, um, that there is a case against Mr. Warner. And therefore, until that is done, there must be the presumption of innocence. Until that is done, there must be, as in all of these cases, criminal cases, uh, a presumption of innocence. So all that probably the Egyptian, the South Africans, the Americans, the British, whoever are saying, there has to be evidence of that in a court of law. Mr. Warner will be entitled through his lawyers to cross-examine and to show that this, there is no case against him. And that has to be done in the court. And Mr. Warner would be entitled, like any other individual, to apply to the magistrate to have the proceedings quashed on the ground of a breach of public law principles or on the ground of a violation of constitutional rights. Under Section 14 of the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Warner can ask for the matter to be referred to the High Court to determine whether his rights have been infringed and the Judicial Review Act of Trinidad and Tobago give him and his lawyers the right to go to court to apply for judicial review in respect of the matter. And in respect of all those matters, he has a right of appeal to the High Court and a right of appeal to the Privy Council. So this process can take two months and it can take five or seven years. This is not a process where because a country asks for you to be extradited, you are automatically extradited. I mean, that is, that is what we decided when we were negotiating this treaty because you're asking a, a national or someone from Trinidad and Tobago to face trial abroad. And there are many other legal considerations. Are the offenses which you are charging Mr. Warner for, are they also offenses which, if committed in Trinidad and Tobago, can be prosecuted? And there are many other points um, that can be taken. I do not know the facts of the case. I cannot determine the merits of the case. But that is what the magistrate is going to determine, and if necessary, a judge. Have Mr. Warner approached you for any... Oh, yes. uh, Mr. Warner has not approached me for any assistance, but I, I've spoken to Mr. Warner, and he has spoken to me since his arrest. Well, that is, a, that is a sign of desperation because I think the Prime Minister had a duty as Prime Minister, as Prime Minister, having made the comment she made about Mr. Warner and having heard his response, should recognize that Mr. Warner is entitled, is entitled, he's cooperating as he said, and he's entitled to employ due process of law, which is a requirement under the Constitution and the Prime Minister took an oath to uphold the Constitution and the law, and the Constitution give to Mr. Warner and the laws give to him the right to due process of law. So she cannot overthrow due process of law for Mr. Warner. Ms. Maraj, last question. What are your, were your topic of discussion when you and Mr. Warner had, had, had spoke? Mr. Warner and myself have been friends. We have had our misunderstanding. And if you remember that... Um, um, we were on a political mission together and then he and uh, Mr. Dukran and Mrs. Bisesa decided to snatch him away and um, I, I've remained friends with Mr. Warner and we talk, we talk, but I don't think it's right for me to discuss what me and Mr. Warner talk about. How do you feel about the whole incident with Mr. Warner? I mean, uh, as a friend going way back when and you all still maintain that relationship now. Mr. Warner has assisted the UNC. I was in the UNC. He has given financial, political assistance to the UNC. He has assisted the Prime Minister. He has given financial donations to the party. In the last general election of 2010, if you wanted to give a donation to the partnership, you had to write three checks, one to the party and two to other individuals. It is well known the time will come when some of those checks would surface. So I do not know why people are trying to um, say that Mr. Warner did not help the UNC. Do you, do you have an idea how much money Mr. Warner pumped into the UNC for the 2010 general election? When I was of influence in the UNC, Mr. Warner made substantial contributions. In the 20 general, 2010 general elections, I knew of Mr. Warner's assistance to the UNC. Are you talking, financial. About, are you talking millions of dollars? Oh yes, millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And if Mr. Warner, yeah, if, if Mr. Warner pay a bill
for the finance campaign. He's making a contribution to the UNC campaign. If he pays Mr. Ross, he's making a, a, a contribution to the campaign. Will okay. you to these checks, Mr. 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 Mirage? I think, I think All right, okay. and the proper approach to constitutional rights in an emergency. The first question concerns the justification of a state of emergency. Declaring an emergency in 2011, the President described a spate of murder murders and a surge in gang violence. He said this was related to recent drug seizures. There was a risk of reprisals. Innocent people were caught up in violence between gangs. He said, the unprecedented escalation of murders and other serious acts of violence and lawlessness warrant the adoption of more decisive and stronger action to ensure the safety of the public. A common response was that this was not a crisis justifying emergency powers. In an exceptional crisis, the normal institutions of state might be disrupted or rendered inadequate by events or put under direct attack. When that happens, we tend to accept the state's use of emergency powers to perform its duty to protect us uh, and restore the normal institutions to full function. The criticism of the emergency in 2011 was this was a different kind of case. The justification seemed to be uh, that the emergency powers were needed to boost the ability of the state to perform its duty allow it to act more decisively against crime. So the President's statement raises the question, what is a public emergency? And that debate entails the second question, who decides? We may find compelling arguments for saying the crisis described wasn't an emergency, but does the Constitution permit review by the courts of the decision to declare one? What should the scope of that review be? And the third question, raised by the invoking of emergency powers, is whether the emergency justifies the specific measures taken. Uh, the emergency regulations of 2011 restricted freedom of assembly and expression. Uh, it gave the government power to order indefinite detention without charge. Were they justified by the threat described? So the first question, was there a public emergency? Well, the Constitution provides that there's a public emergency when the country is at war or when Parliament has, by special majority, declared that the democratic institutions of the country are threatened by subversion or when the President has declared that a public emergency exists. And under Section 8, he may so declare if he's satisfied that a public emergency has arisen because A, a war is imminent, B, because of a calamity such as an earthquake, hurricane, or Section 8.2.C, and this is the relevant one, that action has been taken or is immediately threatened by any person of such a nature and on so extensive a scale as to be likely to endanger the public safety or to deprive the community or any substantial portion of the community of supplies or services essential to life. Uh, in 2011, the president, the president declared himself satisfied that the public safety was endangered. 
No, the public safety is a reasonably familiar, if broad, term. How much danger to the public safety constitutes a public emergency? And looking at subsection uh, 8.2c as a whole, and at the other examples of a public emergency in the Constitution, we might posit that the danger to the public safety should be of a widespread and exceptional nature. And we get the same message from the International Covenant. Uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, of which Trinidad is a signatory. Article 4 says, in time of public emergency which threatens the life of the nation, states may take measures derogating from their obligations under the covenant to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. Article 15 of the European Convention uses a similar term, a public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Uh, the European Court has considered the meaning of that phrase. Its definition of a public emergency is an actual or imminent crisis whose effects involve the whole population and which threatens the organized life of the community. And the crisis must be exceptional in that the normal measures permitted to the state for the maintenance of public safety, public order, are plainly inadequate. In 1985, the UN promulgated the Syracuse Principles to expand on the International Covenant. And they propose a similar definition to the European Court. And they say the crisis must be one that threatens the physical integrity of the population or the existence or basic functioning of institutions indispensable to ensure and project the rights recognized by the covenant. And they go on to say that internal unrest doesn't qualify unless it's a grave and imminent threat to the life of the nation. Uh, there is actually one case where a court has considered the meaning of the phrase found in Section 8.2c of the Trinidad and Tobago Constitution, and that was in Papua New Guinea, a case of Southern Highlands Provincial Government. In that case, the head of state declared an emergency in the Southern Highlands Province, took control from the local government on the ground that corruption and bad administration had led to a breakdown in law and order. He said that was a public emergency, as defined in section 226C of the Papua New Guinea Constitution, because it was likely to endanger the public safety or to deprive the community of supplies or services essential to life. Rejecting that proposition, the court said an organized attack by criminals of wide-scale proportion on citizens or government if it reaches a level which causes civil disorder or cripples civil government may come within C. It's not intended to include ordinary criminal activities. So if we accept those definitions, there's plainly a doubt over whether the situation described in 2011 would amount to a public emergency. But who decides that question? Is it a matter for the court? Let's consider the Constitution first. We're concerned with the proclamation by the President. We saw that's provided for by Section 8. Then under Section 9, within three days, the President delivers to the House of Representatives a statement setting out the specific grounds on which his decision was based. And the House must debate this statement within 15 days. The proclamation will lapse after 15 days unless extended by the House under Section 10. Uh, by Section 10.1, uh, it can vote by simple majority to extend the emergency for up to three months at a time and no more than six months in aggregate. And after those six months, Section 10.2 requires that further extensions of up to three months at a time may only be made by special majority of both Houses of Parliament. So the Constitution sets a clear procedure for the declaration and continuation of a state of emergency, which is begun by the executive, but ratified by Parliament. Can the court review those decisions? Well, uh, the Constitution provides that a proclamation uh, 
is not effective unless it contains a declaration that the President is satisfied that there's a public emergency in one of the categories. Now, if he must be satisfied, applying ordinary principles of judicial review, uh, we might say the court can subject his satisfaction to a familiar judicial analysis uh, based upon the Tameside case. Uh, in the words of Lord Diplock, did he ask himself the right question? And did he take reasonable steps to acquaint himself with the relevant information to enable him to answer it correctly? That might entail checking that the President understood what he had to be satisfied of and assessing whether material existed from which he could reasonably be satisfied. So to do that, the first place the court will look will be the reasons given by the President, his statement setting out the specific grounds on which his decision was based. There lies a reason for caution on the part of the court. The statement is expressly for Parliament. It's to be presented to the House and debated if the House has debated the grounds for the President's decision and found them adequate, there's an obvious reason for caution, respect for Parliament's constitutional function. The related reason is that the question whether there's an emergency is primarily a matter for administrative and political assessment and not a legal question. In the English case of A and the Home Secretary, commonly known as the Belmarsh case, the House of Laws said this was a matter of relative institutional competence. Uh, one issue in that case was whether the possibility of a terrorist attack could be said to be a threat to the life of the nation. Uh, Lord Bingham, with whom the majority agreed, found that there was no reason for the court to overturn the government's judgment that it was such a threat. Uh, on the question of the declaration of a state of emergency, he said that great weight should be given to the judgment of the Home Secretary and Parliament on this question because they were called on to exercise a preeminently political judgment. And on the question of the court, of the role of the court in reviewing that judgment, he said the question was one of demarcation of functions or relative institutional competence. In summary, which is a familiar principle, he said the more purely political a question is, the smaller will be the potential role of the court. And the present question was very much at the political end of the spectrum. Now that does not mean there's no role for the court. Uh, in the Belmarsh case, their lordships followed the judgment of Lord Hoffman in the case of Home Secretary and Raymond, where he asserted the importance of the separation of powers and the primacy of the executive's ju uh, judgment in matters of security. But he also said, it's important neither to blur nor to exaggerate the area of responsibility entrusted to the executive. I think the effect of the English authorities is that if there's material worthy of respect from which the political authorities could reasonably conclude that there is a public emergency, then the court won't interfere with that judgment. But if the court was satisfied there was no material from which to come to that conclusion, or that no reasonable person could so conclude, then it would be bound to say so. And if the court was satisfied from the material presented that the executive hadn't understood the question, it would have to find the declaration of a state of emergency unlawful. Now, that was the conclusion that Lord Hoffman came to in his dissent in the Belmarsh case. He accepted the Home Secretary's judgment that there existed credible evidence of terrorist plots which threatened serious physical damage and loss of life. But he held that when the government said, therefore there was a threat to the life of the nation, it misunderstood the meaning of the phrase. And that may be a question the courts will be asked to decide about the emergency in 2011. Could the situation described by the President be said to meet the definition of a public emergency? Was he describing a threat to the existence or basic function 
of the institutions of state. That said, uh, if the courts were to rule the declaration of a state of emergency invalid, they would be taking an uncommon step. Lord Hoffman's judgment in Belmarsh was a rarity in challenging the government's assessment of an emergency. A survey of other jurisdictions shows almost no decisions by the courts rejecting the government's decision to declare a state of emergency. Uh, the Papua New Guinea decision in the Southern Highlands case stands alone. Well, we know the reason for that. The question whether there's an emergency is highly political. Uh, also, perhaps more important factor, it's not really the most important question for the court. The more important question uh, is whether the emergency justifies the specific measures curtailing fundamental rights. And with that question, the courts are on more familiar ground. They are performing their acknowledged constitutional role. They can employ tried and tested methods, and they can use those methods to express doubts about the emergency with less fear of overstepping constitutional boundaries. In Trinidad and Tobago, the question is set by Section 7.3 of the Constitution, which permits emergency measures to have effect, even though inconsistent with fundamental rights, except insofar as they may be shown not to be reasonably justifiable for the purpose of dealing with the situation that exists during the emergency period. The phrase reasonably justifiable entails a proportionality test. Now, that was decided by the Privy Council in the Antiguan case of De Freitas and the Ministry of Agriculture. And in summary, that test goes, the aim must be important enough to justify limiting a fundamental right. The measures designed to meet the aim must be rationally connected to it. Uh, and the means used which impair the right must be no more than is necessary to achieve that aim. So that's a familiar test. Uh, the courts here are on familiar ground. Uh, and they have a clear constitutional role. The question still arises, how much deference should they afford to the executive's judgment of what was necessary and therefore proportionate? Uh, in the Belmarsh case, their lordships held that the area of discretionary judgment afforded to the executive is much less when restrictions on fundamental rights are being assessed. Their justification for that, in short, was that while the government is the expert on security matters, the courts are the specialists on protection of liberty and other important rights. They also took account of the requirement of the European Convention that emergency measures controlling rights must be strictly required by the situation. That invited close scrutiny by the court of the action taken by the government. The International Covenant in the Trinidad context, contains the same phrase. States may only take measures derogating from their obligations to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. Now that would appear to require the same close scrutiny. But uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, that may meet a, a countervailing factor uh, in the form of what is a somewhat thorny issue the presumption of constitutionality. The words of section 7.3, which provide that measures stand unless shown not to be reasonably justifiable, seem to invoke that presumption and place a burden on the complainant. And that burden's been in place since the 1965 judgment of uh, 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 Chief Justice Wooding in Beckles and Delamore. But uh, that presumption and that burden seem to be at odds with the presumption often expect, expressed in rights cases that there should be a heavy onus on the state to justify infringements of important rights. The Belmarsh case being but one example. So this is another stage in the, in the decision making where the court will have to accommodate opposing constitutional principles. Turning to the emergency powers regulations of 2011, I'll briefly set out some matters 
that might come under scrutiny. Now, one remarkable factor is that it appears the government didn't design the regulations for the situation it found in 2011. Rather, as many of you will be aware, they were copied from the Emergency Powers Regulations of 1990. And those regulations, in turn, were a copy of the regulations of 1970. So the measures introduced in 2011 appear to have been originally designed for the emergency of 1970. The Black Power Revolution, civil unrest, general strikes. That must have implications for the presumption of constitutionality and the question of justification. Section 7.1 of the Constitution says the President may make emergency regulations due regard being had to the circumstances of the situation. Proportionality requires that measures must be designed for the threat and rationally connected to it. So why ban public meetings except by permission of the police, as Regulation 7.1 did? Or the use of loudspeakers in a public place, as Regulation 14.2 did? The use of those measures in 1970 is easily explicable. But it's harder to see why it was necessary in 2011 to counter gang crime to place those restraints on free speech and assembly. As for the cases now in the courts, we can expect them to challenge the regulations which boosted the authorities' powers of arrest and detention. And of those, the most intrusive provisions were those of Schedule 2 of the regulation. They gave the Minister for National Security power to order indefinite detention of a person without charge if he was satisfied it was necessary to prevent that person acting in a manner prejudicial to the public safety. If the courts apply the proportionality test to those powers, they may be asking, what was it about the emergency of 2011 that made them necessary? What reasons were there for saying the criminal justice system, acting under normal restraints, was inadequate to deal with the situation? Were they good reasons for setting aside fundamental rights and giving the government the power of detention? So as we've seen, in doing so, the courts will also have to ask themselves difficult questions as to the extent of their constitutional role and where to find a balance between opposing constitutional principles. I look forward to hearing the courts of Trinidad and Tobago give their answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Very interesting discussion. And in fact, in, in listening to him, um, I was reminded uh, a year or two ago, I was invited to, um, to prepare draft legislation dealing with national um, disasters in Trinidad and Tobago. And in the course of my review, I was, I was actually, I thought, remarkable that it does not appear in our present legislation that there is any provision for the declaration of a state of disaster, a little different from a state of emergency, but the, the consequence is pretty much the same, which is by way of an act or way of a declaration that public safety can be secured. And in relation to that, our existing legislation does not seem to, to make or have enabling powers. Um, in fact, in the, in the draft legislation which is proposed and which I hope will eventually find the light of day, what is contemplated in terms of disasters in Trinidad and Tobago is that there would be three tier, a three tier, a tier approach whereby the first would be those disasters which are localized or regional or, or which can be dealt with by the local services. The second would be a national disaster which does not overwhelm the national capacity to respond and which can be dealt with nationally and of course which may well require the invocation of a state of disaster. The third would be those disasters which does in fact overwhelm our natural and national resources and requires, if you like, a regional or an international response, which of course also requires both the invocation of the state of disaster and the necessity for some sort of global response. 
So certainly you, your, your, your invitation to us to consider looking at our legislation, which seems to have still been underpinned by the events of 1970, has a remarkable parallel in national disaster issues as well. So thank you so much for that very incisive commentary, Robert. Good. These papers are, uh, have had a lot of requests um, from persons who are interested, not just persons who are here, um, but who would need or want access to these papers which are being delivered. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that by their very scholarly content, it, it, it does require um, some sort of permanent record. And I'm pleased to say that the TTLN will be, by very early next week, putting them in their entirety on our websites which allows me to invite our presenters to please ensure, particularly our overseas presenters, but before you go, I would be grateful if you can send me electronic copies of your various presentations. It, it would be a very important part of the repository that TTLN is compiling. We have um, uh, several people who are outside who wish entry in, and, and I'm very grateful to the principal of the Hugh Wooding Law School who has made the moot court available as an overflow so that there are persons in that particular room who are listening and hearing us and perhaps even seeing us as well. And this, this applies as well globally because we are, national, we are televised and we are going on various radio stations as well. And many of these persons would have um, come, not specifically, but particularly to hear from our next presenter who is Sir Fenton Ramsahoy. Sir Fenton was born in Guyana in 1929. He became a member of the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn in 1950 and was called to the English bar on the 10th of February 1953. Now he's coming to the podium but I will, I will invite him to have a seat because I will not do him the injustice of not going through his bio. So Sir Fenton, please have a seat while I complete this. It's a very important discourse. He was called to the English bar on the 10th of February 1953 and he became and took senior counsel in 1971. He took his Bachelor of Arts, his LLB, his LLM, and his PhD degrees from the University of London. And in fact, and I didn't know this, his doctorate was taken at the London School of Economics and Politics um, in uh, 1959 for his seminal work in English and Roman Dutch law. His thesis was published in 1964 as the development of land law in British Guyana, and he was awarded the LLD Honoris Causa by the University of the West Indies in, 19, in, sorry, in 2012. He was made a Knight Grand Cross of Antigua and Barbuda in 2004 and was appointed Attorney General in 1961 when Guyana was given internal self-government. While Attorney General, he had drafted numerous legislation which introduced into the Legislative Assembly in 1963 the ordinance which established the University of Guyana. This is a very happy homecoming for him because in fact um, he has worked tirelessly in promoting not only Caribbean jurisprudence but also the work of the various law schools. He was from 1961 a cabinet minister in the elected government which was overthrown in 1964 and, um, and subsequently he remained a member of parliament sitting on the opposition benches until 1973. He worked for the Council of Legal Education as deputy director and had a responsibility for setting up our very law school that we are in, the Hugh Wooding Law School in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, he was head of the law school when it accepted its first students from the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies in Barbados in 1973. Sir Fenton has been in regular practice in several territories of the West Indies and has appeared in the Privy Council on numerous occasions, in fact, for the past 50 years. He has appeared before the Caribbean Court of Justice on appeals from Guyana, which abolished appeals to the Privy Council in 1972, and uh, was acceded to, and in fact, which acceded to, forgive me, which acceded to the Caribbean Court of Justice as its final court, or its final appellate court in 2005. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in inviting Sir Fenton to present his paper, The Justice Trajectory Post-Independence. Thank you, Ronnie. Ladies and gentlemen, I speak to you as one who has lived in the system for over 60 years. As a litigator, almost every day, every working day, and this is what I have to say now about the trajectory of the justice system before independence and after it. 
Within two decades of the end of the Second World War in 1945, the United Nations as an international organization was established and the demand for independence of colonial territories which had already been granted on the Indian subcontinent in 1946 became louder with each passing year. The British West Indies created a problem because the colonies were many and scattered and while a benefit from their political unity was foreseen by the British, the colonies themselves were not unanimous at such a prospect. The British tried a policy of federation in 1958, but it did not succeed and the territories went their own separate ways. They could not survive without the rule of law and throughout the territories a system of civil and criminal justice was developed to deal with contentious and non-contentious business. That system constituted the colonial inheritance which the territories which became independent enjoyed after the middle of the 20th century when internal self-government and later independence were the signposts which ended colonial rule. The justice system was at the heart of the colonial inheritance when countries became independent. It was characterized by the reception of English law, which gradually overtook other legal systems with inherited laws from the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish. It was a colorful inheritance overlooked by imperial officials who were responsible for the creation of the legal framework in which the justice system was to be administered. From meager beginnings, the colonial system developed to the point at which a workable system of justice was in place at the end of the 20th century in every territory under the Pax Britannica. The system of justice in every colony depended upon the nature of its economy and by that its efficacy was judged under imperial rule. In the West Indies, the economy was for the most part a plantation economy, with trade and commerce taking a less important place apart from the trade in sugar and its derivatives. Inquiries into the administration of justice were undertaken from time to time, and the legal history of the West Indian territories recorded consistent development because of the imperial interest and the appointment of competent officials. Many of them had experience in other territories of the British Empire where the same process was taking place. The West Indies did not have systems of customary law as there was in Africa and Asia, but the administration of a mixture of English law and practice with principles of law and practice of other European countries which had ruled some colonies was a challenge which had to be met. The uniting feature was that under British rule, the legal profession was drawn from persons who were required to be qualified in Britain in order to be allowed to practice in the colonies. The appointment of judges and other judicial officers was in the hands of the imperial rulers. The governor had some responsibility for the appointments of a lower order, but higher appointments were made by what was then the colonial office. With the passage of time, appointments were made from the colonial legal profession and the colonial office relieved itself from the burden of finding appointees among the professionals in Britain and its dominions. For this reason, there existed at independence 
Judges who owed their appointments to the colonial office but were drawn from the colonial legal profession. These judges were all men. They held high office with distinction at independence. Any fair analysis will conclude that at independence, the countries had a secure foundation to promote and sustain the rule of law. The justice system was until independence on an upward trajectory. The judges who served the justice system in the 19th and 20th centuries up to the time of independence, which Britain commenced to grant in the early 1960s, worked in a framework of courts which changed from time to time. The main institutions or courts described as high courts and supreme courts, courts of appeal, including the West Indian Court of Appeal comprising colonial chief justices, the Federal Supreme Court, and the British Caribbean Court of Appeal. Throughout this time, final appeals could be taken to his or her majesty in council, but appeals were restricted and the Privy Council had made it clear that it was not a court of criminal appeal and that it would defer to local courts where the judges were likely to be more aware of conditions in the territories than persons sitting in Westminster. When independence came, the legal environment which had provided an improving system of justice change with the introduction of independence constitutions establishing an altered system of courts. Expansive changes in constitutional law came about because of constitutional guarantees which were sought to safeguard public rights and the public interest when the Pax Britannica came to an end. Changes brought about by the Treaty of Rome did not alter the legal position in the British West Indian territories. But when independence came, the work of the European institutions in the area of human rights soon became most influential, while the expansive reach of administrative law in Britain also influenced the legal systems post-independence. The legal environment began to change considerably and for justice to be administered in legal systems with increasing sophistication, heavy burdens were imposed upon the judicial officers and the legal profession. The system of courts was not unified after independence, neither was the legal profession. Territories retained separate courts, appointed separate judges, and the legal profession was separate in each territory. The Caribbean Court of Justice was an attempt to have an overarching final appellate court to replace the Privy Council. But the courts, save for the Eastern Caribbean, have remained separate with their separate legal professions and separate access of litigants to bodies charged with the discipline of lawyers who repudiate ethical obligations. Prior to independence, there was a link between the education of colonial lawyers and the system of legal education in England. Post-independence, the link was almost entirely broken because lawyers are trained within the territories under a system with a council of legal education at the apex. The right, to, the right to practice involves accreditation by institutions of the council. The characteristic features of the system of justice prior to independence was a common training in Britain before admission to practice and rigorous discipline in the work of judicial tribunals and judicial officers. It is these features which saw the absence of the most serious infection which has affected the legal system post-independence, and that is delay, which has become the system's characteristic affliction in most territories. Adjournments are many and easy 
and this is the result of indiscipline. Judges and lawyers are to blame. A system whereby in the high courts a matter is passed from hand to hand among judges contributes to this. A judicial circuiteer has no sense of responsibility for any matters, even though the rules allow the same judge to deal with a matter so long as this is practicable. It is always practicable unless administrative fault makes it impracticable. Once heard, a litigant may suffer enormous delays in having judgments delivered. This was never the case prior to independence, but it is a feature now. The question may be asked, why this is so? The answer is that persons who have the responsibility are not able, ready, or willing to undertake it even though delay hurts litigants and bars them from proceeding to appeal if a judgment is adverse. It has been declared in a judgment arising in Trinidad that the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago does not provide for a hearing within a reasonable time. And so the benefit of that particular guarantee which appears in all the other independence constitutions is not available in Trinidad and Tobago. It is perhaps appropriate to say that the common law has always assumed a fair hearing within a reasonable time. And for that reason, judges made efforts to empty the jails where persons awaited trial. The principle can be no different in relation to civil cases where delay can and will amount to a denial of rights. Judges must be aware of this. The constitutional guarantee will not add to their awareness. The West Indian territories inherited a system with Magna Carta as one of its foundations. When King John was asked to agree to the clauses of Magna Carta, one was a promise that only qualified persons or to be appointed justiciars. They administered justice in the king's name. What was expected was that persons sufficiently learned and with intellectual and moral integrity were to be appointed. Eight centuries later, there is still in these territories a doubt whether the promise has always been kept. Once an argument before the Privy Council, I felt obliged to observe that the Constitution spoke of an impartial tribunal, but it did not mention a competent one. Lord Gough, who was on the bench, responded by saying that surely the provision must mean a competent tribunal. He was correct. The problem is whether those responsible for the creation of the tribunals to which the constitutions refer, always understand it in that way. The infection of delay has not affected every territory in the same way. In some territories, it is far worse than in others. And for that reason, there is usually a backlog of cases which will never be dealt with in the system. Litigants and witnesses as well as lawyers die during the delay with the consequent loss of rights and the denial of obligations. The delay in delivery of judgment may be caused by different reasons, but a judge who is assisted by competent counsel who set out the facts to be ascertained, the issues to be resolved, and the authorities which are relevant ought to be able to deliver judgment at the end of the hearing without delay. It may take some time to write a judgment and to have it printed and circulated, but that ought not to involve the kind of delay which will hurt a litigant who will usually crave a written judgment. A delay bars the entry of an appeal, and this is a serious breach of a court's constitutional obligations if the delay is longer than is necessary 
for a competent tribunal to do its work. Where there is delay, a litigant must wait. The delay, if the delay takes place in the higher courts, he can complain to no authority. Complaints to chief justices have been known to be useless where other judges have caused litigants to suffer by delay. The independence of the judiciary is considered to be an ever-widening concept which embraces immunity for causing harm and loss to litigants. It is part of the legal historical tradition that judicial power should be exercised by persons with learning and with intellectual and moral integrity. In the system we have inherited, this burden is put upon lawyers who have earned distinction in the practice of law. A culture in which it is believed that a person is qualified if appointed against one in which a person must be qualified to be appointed can lead only to decline and the subversion of the rule of law. At independence in the 1960s and later, it was thought that the problem of judicial appointments can be resolved by independent service commissions. The system has not worked. It has made little difference to who gets appointed because the considerations which lead to appointments are varied. There has been constitutional change in one territory where judges are appointed on the recommendation of a prime minister. This will only work if the prime minister can be the subject of criticism in parliament, but that is unlikely to happen. No West Indian parliament has seen any such criticism, be it of a service commission or a prime minister. The bar is still divided, as it was prior to independence, into an inner and outer bar. It has come about that the system of elevation has been abused in some cases because elevation has become the reward of political patronage rather than for professional distinction. In these cases, elevation to the inner bar has become a license to secure higher fees for those who have the fortune to have been elevated without achieving professional distinction. Legal education has been delinked substantially from Britain and remains costly if undertaken abroad. The system post-independence has suffered from underfunding and this has led to decline in the strength of teaching. Political aspirations call for a lowering of entry requirements so that legal education will become available to more aspirants and this reduces the level of competitiveness which generates distinction. This situation is unlikely to improve because the economies are weak and the call upon resources continues to limit what can be made available for education, including legal education, which is the main support of the rule of law. The trajectory of the legal system has been downward. It was stable at independence, but the changes which have come about since then have led to decline. An analysis of the work by judicial functionaries shows that they are fair and not compromised by reason of character. Only in one of the territories is it known that justice is bought and sold like a commodity. In that territory, appeals to the Privy Council were abolished within six years of independence with the object of preventing the development of a legal system removed from political control in the administration of civil and criminal justice by removing the independent judicial body, which was at its apex. Here raising complaints are made about persons who are highly placed to administer justice, but compromising judges is not a widespread post-independence feature of the justice system. Judicial integrity post-independence is hardly ever a sale. The colonial system of justice owed its originating allegiance to two of the great legal systems of the world, 
the Roman and the English. Roman law did not influence the development of the law of ownership of immovable property or the law of procedure which was inherited, but it was pervasive in many areas of private law, including the law of servitudes, which is a considerable part of the law of property. Many of the concepts which are used today are derived from Roman law and were integrated for over eight centuries with the common law, which was developed and was passed down to the colonies while the imperial power carried out the responsibilities of government. It was a striking feature of the justice system that at the end of the colonial period, strong foundations had been laid and responsibility for maintaining and improving the system was transferred to the newly independent nations. Even where some territories remained dependent, it was expected that they would participate fully in the maintenance and improvement of the inherited system. If the question were to be asked whether there was confidence in the system when colonial rule came to an end, the answer, an affirmative answer, was likely to be forthcoming. If the same question were to be asked of the same period since the independence movement took root, the answer will be different. The political systems which developed after independence came did not produce effective legal administrators in all the territories. Some fared better than others, but the system as a whole is in decline. At independence, the imperial rulers offered to provide a final court at their own cost, while members of the legal profession in Britain always stood ready to give up service. Nationalism provided the urge to break with the final court, and the establishment of the Caribbean Court of Justice was the response. The Caribbean Court of Justice will not stop the decline which came about by reason of the failure of discipline and the absence of the required sense of responsibility which became pervasive within the independent justice system. A litigant desiring to settle a dispute of importance must have his case heard usually by a high court and a court of appeal before it can reach the Caribbean Court or the Privy Council. The two preceding steps along the way can be characterized by delay, and very often there is a failure to write reasons for what is decided in the High Court or the Court of Appeal. This can also cause delay. In this respect, standards vary within the territories because there is no unified system of courts and procedure and no unified legal profession. These two features are the source of much of the decline in the efficacy of the justice system. It is a truism that once the system is allowed to weaken, it quickly reaches the point where it becomes irreparable. In that event, money thrown at it will be found to be useless or ineffectual. These matters are usually the subject of statistics, but there is little publicly available. If funding was provided, there will be lawyers and research students to study the cases, the judgments dealing with the grant or refusal of leave where required, and final or interlocutory adjudications with appropriate commentary from qualified persons who have researched and digested the documentary material. It is of the greatest importance that for every territory, the public should have statistics of the number of cases brought, the number determined, the number of judgments written and by whom, and the figures showing how many cases were brought and abandoned along the way for one reason or another. Despite rumblings that the Caribbean should resort to its own courts for the settlement of disputes, the Privy Council remains willing as a matter of constitutional obligation to hear appeals. Whether an appeal is heard depends upon whether an appeal is of right or whether it is heard by special leave. The system is restrictive, but it is necessary 
if numbers of matters dealt with are kept within bounds. But it happens that many litigants are aggrieved by the, refusals, by the refusal of the Privy Council or the Caribbean Court to refuse to hear an appeal and is, there is no further tribunal to which resort can be had. The final courts remain supreme, even though they may sometimes be fallible. A justice system is not an imposed institution. It develops from need and is organized from time to time as society develops. There is a societal aspect in every element of it. It involves issues relating to race, class, and gender. The system seeks to resolve the varied problems arising from economic and social activity, and of late, the rise in technology. For anyone to understand how the system works, it is necessary to consult the reports in the media where publicity is available. But the surest source of information is the lawyers and litigants who as of this time, a half a century after independence, have the most harrowing stories which involve delay as well as wasted costs and expense. The situation is confused because judicial officers and lawyers share blame while governments always claim that budgetary constraints prevent them from doing all that may be needed for a properly functioning system. The reality is that there is much mismanagement in the administration and wasted costs as lawyers and litigants who use the system become aware. Lawyers within the system are of varying abilities and character and the system loses many of them in court practice because they become frustrated and decide to avoid any kind of court work. Much talent is lost by this process because it is pervasive. Unless the court system functions efficiently, lawyers in litigation who tend to be the ablest that the profession can produce realize that they cannot earn sufficiently by a dilatory system and their departure from or avoidance of it accelerates the decline. These changes have increased since independence as, frustra as frustration increases. The guarantee of a fair hearing within a reasonable time by an independent and impartial tribunal is of no benefit unless it is enforced by skilled judicial officers, an effective administrative organization of the courts, and a competent and honorable legal profession. A constitutional framework for the justice system was put in place at independence. There was agreement that the Privy Council, which was at the apex of the colonial legal system, would be retained as long as it was needed. Its retention reflected a desire that competence and independence should underscore the work of the final court. And there was ample provision for appeals involving matters of substantial monetary value to be allowed as of right. The bar was not set high, and while the appeals were to be heard in England, there were members of the legal profession there who were always willing to lend support to practitioners both before and after independence. Writing on the rule of law, Lord Bingham observed that in some states of the southern United States and in parts of the Caribbean, the poor quality of defense representation is a source of unfairness. The reality is that there is no effective system of legal aid because funds are always inadequate for a program which will enable the more competent and skilled practitioners to represent litigants who have important issues but cannot meet legal costs. Even where a litigant meets costs from his own pocket, the costs may be wasted for inefficient or unskilled representation. The criminal justice system's failure is enormous 
Persons await years before trial and may suffer loss of liberty in the meantime. Excuses for delay proliferate, including a regular one that the court file cannot be found by the prosecutor or witnesses have not yet been found. One lawyer in Barbados described himself in terms he considered appropriate. He says he was not a lawyer, but an adjourner, because he was made to appear many times without being able to secure a hearing for his client. This event fades into insignificance when one considers the laxity with which judicial officers grant adjournments for reasons which are contrived in a system in which part heard cases generate delay. So long as there is under the rules of procedure the power to adjourn cases, there will be abuse with resulting delay and judicial injury to litigants. Theoretically, the legal system presents opportunities for a widening of jurisprudential concepts, but this is at a higher level. The injustice which most affects litigants because of delay in hearing and the delivery of judgment. It is related to the legal skills of those who adjudicate, but standards are falling in the, in the legal profession. The field is written in, English, in the English language, but this is the language in which performance at the tertiary level in the universities is weakest. Many lawyers are not sufficiently competent in English to be involved in legal practice at a satisfactory standard. There is political pressure everywhere to ensure that an increasing number of people secure the declaration that they are qualified professionally, even where standards of entry and standards of academic competence have to be lowered so that politicians who provide funding funding can see such a result. This is a unique post-independence phenomenon. It is a major contributor to the degradation of the justice system. Independence did not destroy insularity. The legal systems remained separate and distinct, and the functionality of the justice system must be judged with reference to each country separately. Where a system is dysfunctional, the lawyers and litigants are aware and they bear witness to decline. The effect upon social and economic activity becomes apparent with each passing day. An independent judicial system is inconsistent with autocracy and despotism. And during the last 60 years, there have been cravings for control of the justice system and the abrogation of, it, of its independence in at least one territory. The Privy Council and the Caribbean Court of Justice will not defeat this functionality because that is generated at the lower levels of the system over which those two final tribunals have no control. It is the task of the government, the appointed judicial officers, the administrative functionaries and the legal profession to maintain the system and to resist decline. The system dis becomes dysfunctional when they fail to fulfill their obligations and to discharge their responsibilities. They cannot be supervised. There is no imperial master. It is a case of self-discipline or no discipline. A sense of responsibility is inherent in the human condition. A functionary suppresses it at his peril. There are not many lawyers in the former British territories of the Caribbean who worked in the period before and after independence came and who are still alive to record the anxieties of clients and the frustrations engendered by the justice system as it is known today. A century from now, lawyers, scholars may wish to know what was the daily experience of those who served within the system at this time. It is to be hoped that all inquirers will be told that the lawyers knew the importance of the rule of law and the work they have done was intended to serve those who relied upon the justice system
for their protection, even though their success varied. The years between 1950 and 2015 mark a unique period culminating with the anniversary of Magna Carta, which marked the concessions given by King John to the barons 800 years ago. The justiciars of the 13th century and the judicial officers who followed them carried on, carried an immense burden which they still carry today. The manner in which the burden has been discharged has varied from territory to territory and from time to time. But while the justice framework continues to exist, the burden will remain while litigants hope that the responsibilities will be discharged. Those who have served the states and the litigants from the benches and the bars have had a unique privilege. They have been privy to both an upward movement and its decline. The questions for the future are whether the decline can be reversed and whether societies which will not sink can survive by adjusting to the change conditions. The national cultures over the past two centuries have been influenced by the legal systems and the kind of justice which was and is being produced. People must live within the system. If rights are denied, and obligations are dishonored without any or any adequate redress, there is none to complain to. The justice system does not take directions, and there is no one and no authority to correct it. It determines for itself how its responsibilities are discharged. It knows that the rule of law is of the essence of civilization. And if it fails or it's subverted, economic and social consequences, which no one intends, will surely follow. A nation must adjust to failure in the same way as it enjoys success. Institutions are administered by individuals who may poison them or preserve and improve their strength. That is always an option. The justice system we inherited is a proud inheritance born of the ablest communities the Western world has known. It is hard to lose that inheritance or to allow it to be lost. To remember it is to inspire ourselves to adjust and readjust so as to leave for those coming after us the kind of inheritance of which we have been a most privileged beneficiary. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Fenton, for that very powerful paper entitled The Justice Trajectory in Post-Independence. Yes. Earlier I told you I was intrigued by the title, and, and perhaps some of you were as well, and having, having, um, having listened, um, certainly Sir Fenton's views that the justice trajectory is downwards and there is a certain amount of pessimism associated with his remarks. Um, certainly from a civil proceedings point of view and those of us who are involved in Trinidad and Tobago in the civil arena um, will recognize that the civil proceedings rules which took effect I think in 2006 has to some extent addressed and I think functionally addressed the many um, delays that were in, in, in embedded in our institutions and happily for us and I, and I, mean, I practice in the civil courts, I can say happily, the, the delays that may have occasioned before are not as apparent as they are. In fact, many matters are being resolved as quickly as possible. So that there is some room, Sir Fenton, in Trinidad and Tobago, certainly from the civil arena, for optimism that our, not only our, our judges are dealing with matters decisively and quickly, but that judgments are being delivered with one or two exceptions, generally. So. Um, it's, it's something that we applaud and certainly which we in, encourage. But thank you so very much for that very, very powerful, incisive commentary. Our next paper is being delivered by James Guthrie, Queen's Council.
Scathrew is called to the bar in 1975 and took silk in 1993 and was made a recorder in 1999. He has considerable experience of litigation um, in both, in, in fact, in most Commonwealth jurisdictions, both in an advisory capacity and as an advocate, and has been called to the bars of variously the Turks and Caicos, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Christopher and Nevis, Grenada, Bermuda, Belize, Antigua, and the Cayman Islands. He's truly a Caribbean man insofar as, the, as to his juridical attempts and juridical um, practice. He is, in fact, or was, in fact, um, head of chambers at Three Hair Court from 2002 to 2010. His current work, in, that's in 2015, is in several um, categories of constitutional law, human rights, judicial review, and civil fraud. These cases typically involve either appellate work or work that is connected with the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, both at first instance and at appellate levels, and in fact in many Commonwealth countries, including Trinidad and Tobago. He regularly acts for Commonwealth governments and law officers. And in fact, and I noted this with, in with interest, that he appeared before the Privy Council at his very first sittings outside of London. Um, this would be in the Bahamas and in the first sitting in Mauritius in 2008. He has also appeared by, by special permission in the Court of Appeal of Mauritius. Mm -hmm. Guthrie has regularly appeared in fraud and political and criminal matters in the Caribbean with current cases in Jamaica, Antigua, Belize, the British Virgin Islands, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, Dominica, and the Cayman Islands. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure, as me, that we are eagerly anticipating his paper, which is entitled Judicial Bias. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have actually um, spoken in this very room once before, and I'm ashamed to say it was 25 years ago um, when I was teaching a short course on advocacy. I don't know whether any of my former pupils will be here. Um, it's of course an enormous pleasure to be back and um, I have been back on many occasions since then. Um, most notably when uh, Ramesh Maharaj instructed me to appear on his behalf in 2001 um, in uh, the cases involving the previous election and the possible disqualification of two of the elected members. Also in that case were others present in this room, um, uh, most notably, of course, Sir Fenton, also Fayyad Hussain. And all I can say is that it gives me the greatest of pleasure to see that um, their independence of mind and idealism remains uh, undimmed, and that certainly all three of them remain in what I can only describe as showroom condition. <laughs> um, now, uh, my topic um, is judicial bias, and I think it perhaps follows on reasonably uh, smoothly from Sir Venton's concerns about the system which we have to operate with. Um, I chose it because it provides a neat example of the application of common law and constitutional principles to our work as lawyers, if not necessarily every day. Uh, bias is, of course, rather a provocative concept. We hope uh, and we like to believe that our judges are free from any taint of it. I would nevertheless suggest that the price of such freedom, as of any other, is unceasing vigilance, and that means unceasing vigilance by us, the lawyers. Now, at least three overlapping principles are involved um, with the avoidance of bias. It is more usually, of course, the avoidance of apparent bias, but the um, principles include uh, judicial independence and the separation of powers about which we've already heard something today. And the importance of those principles hardly need restating to the company assembled here. They're fundamental to the common law, 
They're enshrined in the constitutions of the free world among the fundamental human rights and freedoms provisions. And as to the values, the Commonwealth constitutions of the Caribbean speak with one voice. Now, actual judicial bias or demonstrable actual judicial bias may be rare, but of course it has been demonstrated from time to time. One of the first occasions on which I had the pleasure of appearing with Mr. Maharaj involved uh, actual judicial bias. I understand that the judge concerned has since distinguished himself and redeemed his um, uh, situation, so I won't mention his name, but he was a magistrate here and uh, he um, acquitted, some say rather surprisingly, a defendant charged with money laundering offences. That might have been that if he had not been unwise enough to have uh, to take delivery of a large car the following week um, and when the paperwork was looked at uh, it appeared to have been paid for by the gentleman um, who had been acquitted only a few days before. Um, um, he's now served his term of imprisonment, it's a very long time ago and as I say his name does not require to be mentioned. But much more usual is apparent bias. Um, the relevant test for that is now well established and it has been since its refinement in 2001 by the well-known case of Porter and McGill. In a recent Privy Council case from the sovereign base areas of Cyprus, Yacoub, uh, Lord Hughes said this, the relevant test is not in dispute. It was set out by Lord Hope with whom the remainder of the court agreed in Porter and McGill. It is entirely consistent with the approach of the European Court of Human Rights to the requirement that a court be impartial, not only in fact, but from an objective viewpoint. Uh, Lord Hope expressed the test in these terms. The question is whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. That and similar formulations use the word biased, which in other contexts has far more pejorative connotations, to mean the absence of demonstrated independence or impartiality. Lord Hope made this clear in the case of Miller and Dixon. The appearance of independence and impartiality is just as important as the question whether these qualities exist in fact. Justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. The function of the right is not only to secure that the tribunal is free from any actual personal bias or prejudice, it requires this matter to be viewed objectively. The aim is to exclude any legitimate doubt as to the tribunal's independence and impartiality. So the cases emphasize that it is the appearance of justice that counts. In Pinochet, which you'll all know, um, Lord Nolan said, in any case where the impartiality of a judge is in question, the appearance of the matter is just as important as the reality. It is no answer for the judge to say that he is not in fact impartial, or he is in fact impartial, and that he will abide by his judicial oath. The purpose of the disqualification is to preserve the administration of justice from any suspicion. Now, in the uh, Caribbean context, complaints of judicial bias can be articulated in straightforward constitutional terms. What can be said is that the case concerned has not had a fair hearing by an independent and impartial court. That right is equivalent to the fair trial guarantee of Article 6 of the European Convention and it is enshrined in the common law. Now the consequences um, are um, are these. If the complaint is upheld, then that is the end of the matter. The consequences may be inconvenient, they may be extreme, but that does not matter. The judges' decisions and orders cannot stand. Um, the uh, qualities of judicial, I'm quoting here, the qualities of judicial independence and impartiality are absolute and permit no compromise. And I take that statement from 
um, a case in Brunei involving the son of the Sultan, who said that nobody could give him a fair trial there because the Sultan was the uh, plaintiff effectively and he was the defendant and no court would decide against the Sultan. Um, however, uh, as we shall see, he was wrong. Um, but uh, the sanction that the law affords is that the court's decisions will be set aside, and that will be that. Um, and uh, uh, I think on reflection, it will be accepted that that must be so. The clearest explanation perhaps was given by Lord Hope in Miller and Dixon, a case which uh, you may know, but involved the terms upon which temporary judges were appointed in Scotland. They were appointed on one-year renewable contracts, and it was held in those circumstances because um, uh, their continued employment uh, would uh, be in the hands of the executive on a fairly regular basis. They could not be regarded as um, uh, safe hands to decide a um, uh, person's rights. And um, Lord Hope said that the right was fundamental to the right to fair trial. And just as the right to a fair trial is incapable of being modified or restricted in the public interest, so too the right to an impartial and independent tribunal is an absolute right. Um, it is an essential element if the trial is to satisfy the overriding element of, of fairness. Uh, it has to be judged, ladies and gentlemen, from the moment that the judge or tribunal first becomes seized of the case. Um, it stands apart from any questions which may be raised about the character or the quality or the effect of any of the decisions that the judge must, uh, which, which, make, which, which the judge makes in the proceedings. If circumstances exist which give rise to a suspicion about the judge's impartiality, those circumstances are sufficient to disqualify, although in fact no bias um, exists. Uh, that was the rule which was applied in Pinochet. Um, the result was in no way dependent on the judge personally holding any view or having any objective requiring the question whether Senator Pinochet should be extradited. The fairness of the proceedings is not what is in question, um, but uh, it is impossible to um, uphold it if the um, issue of the judge's fairness itself um, is decided against him. So it makes no difference at all if the orders made by the judge may be justified or even if they were made by consent. Uh, and that was um, the case in Miller and Dixon. Some of the defendants tried by the judges concerned had pleaded guilty, but their pleas had to be set aside because the judge was not sufficiently independent to be sitting in the court at all. So, members of the jury, there are two Caribbean cases which I would like to uh, mention. The first comes from Belize, and it deals in particular with the concept of the notional fair-minded and independent observer, who is the person whose objective assessment of the situation provides the relevant test. The case is called Belize Bank and the Attorney General of Belize. And the circumstances were briefly that the new government of the day, this was in 2011, had appointed appeal board. Um, and the appeal board was to hear complaints about the government's predecessor, complaints which had a political character. So the case was both political and it was fact sensitive. It resulted in a majority decision in the Privy Council rejecting the complaint of apparent bias, but with an interesting and, I think, persuasive dissent by Lord Brown. The um, contribution to principle, as I say, is most notably to be found in the discussion of the attributes of the notional observer. Lord Kerr, who delivered the leading judgment, said this, the notional observer must be presumed to have two characteristics, full knowledge of the material facts and fair-mindedness. One should recall Lord Steyn's approval in Lowell and Northern Spirit of Mr. Justice Kirby's comment in Johnson & Johnson. A reasonable member of the public is neither complacent nor unduly sensitive or suspicious. Uh, and Lord Hope had said in Gillies and the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, the fair-minded and informed observer can be assumed to have access 
to all the facts that are capable of being known by members of the public generally, bearing in mind that it is the appearance that these facts give rise to that matters, not what is in the mind of the particular judge who is under scrutiny. Of course, one needs to be alert to the danger of transforming the observer from his essential condition of disinterested yet informed neutrality to that of someone who, by dint of his engagement in the system that has generated the challenge, has acquired something of an insider's status. The phrase, capable of being known, from Lord Hope's formulation, holds the key. This does not signify a need to restrict the material to that which is immediately in the public domain. It acknowledges that the observer must have such information as may be um, necessary for an informed member of the public without any particular specialized knowledge or experience to make a dispassionate judgment. As Lord Bingham put it in the Prince Geoffrey case, the requirement that the observer be informed means that he does not come to the matter as a stranger or complete outsider. He must be taken to have a reasonable working grasp of how things are usually done. Now, that seems perhaps to be all very well, but the case provides an example of the difficulties that the application or the imagination of such a person leads to in practice. In considering the notional observer, uh, the Chief Justice in Belize, who was hearing the case at first instance, referred to the ordinary person in Queen Square Market. In the Privy Council, Lord Dyson referred to the fair-minded and informed Belizean. He said that the local context was important and that deference had to be given to the local courts on the issue of what the Belizean observer would have thought. Lord Brown was critical about this. He said, Lord Dyson suggests that the board should recognize that the judges of Belize are better equipped than we are to assess how the fair-minded and informed Belizean would view matters. With the best will in the world, that seems to me to come close to urging an abnegation of this board's proper role in so politically fraught a case as this. Ironically, the very last Belizean appeal to come before us. I had always understood that role to carry with it the responsibility for ensuring to the benefit of Belizeans themselves and of their standing in the wider international community that the highest international standards of justice are maintained in that country. On the issue of apparent bias, there can certainly be no stronger case for deference to the Belizean judges than the Strasbourg Court would afford our judges on a complaint originating in the United Kingdom. I do not believe the Strasbourg case would reject a challenge to the United Kingdom in a comparable case. So um, the question which I leave open for present purposes is whether any safe distinction can be made between the views of a notional observer and the views of the court itself. Can there really be a different in principle? The court must apply an objective test has the administration of justice been compromised? Uh, and then it has to ask, well, what would the fair-minded and informed observer think? And that is, of course, the question when these uh, problems come up that you, um, as lawyers, will be asking yourselves to apply. Um, we're worried about possibly the judge's connection to a particular part of the country or a particular business which is affected by his decision. And you ask yourselves, well, what would a uh, fair-minded and informed observer think about that? Now, the second Caribbean case that I wanted to mention is from St. Vincent. It involves the application of the same test to a different situation. What is to be done when a judge expresses views that indicates his mind has been made up? Um, and I mean, of course, made up before the time when he's supposed to make it up. Now, in Mitchell and George's, um, which was decided at the end of 2014, a number of us, uh, and on this occasion I actually mean a number of us present in this room, um, were concerned with remarks by a judge sitting as a commissioner in an inquiry. Um, uh, I appeared on one side with Mr. Maharaj and um, Mr. Strang, and my learned friend Mr. Um, 
uh, rho appeared on the other side. Um, and um, although he, he cancelled at the last moment, we would also have had Mr. Astafan here, who had appeared at an earlier stage of the proceedings. So I suppose um, if I get this wrong, there'll be a number of people who will be able to put, this, uh, to put me right. But um, uh, the judge concerned was sitting as a commissioner in an inquiry into conduct um, alleged against the former Prime Minister of Belize, Sir James Mitchell. So, I'm sorry? St. Vincent. St. Vincent, I'm sorry, what did I say? I said Belize, good Lord. Hey, was it, hey, well, I, I knew I'd be put right. Um, in, in, um, uh, in St. Vincent, there had been a unsatisfactory attempt to, uh, um, to develop a, um, an island for um, tourist purposes. And um, it was known as the Otley Hall Project. Um, and Sir James Mitchell came in for a good deal of criticism. And the new government, which took over from him, thought that the um, way to deal with this would be to appoint a commission of inquiry to look into the matter, uh, which obviously had political overtones. Um, and uh, such commissions of inquiry as you will know, are not unknown in this part of the world. Uh, it's not unknown that new governments institute them for the purposes of investigating what has been done by their predecessors and making such political capital out of it as they think they can. Anyway, um, in the course of an interim report, the judge um, made a number of remarks um, which uh, suggested uh, that he had not been impressed with Sir James's part in the project. Um, Sir James challenged those decisions um, by way of judicial review and sought orders that the judge concerned, Mr Justice Georges, should play no further part in the Commission of Inquiry. Now, he succeeded um, in the... High Court, I'm sorry, uh, the, um, Sir James Mitchell's case uh, uh, was unsuccessful in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, um, and the criticisms that he made of the judge's um, lack of independence and bias were rejected. But um, he succeeded in the Privy Council. and. Um, I would respectfully suggest that he obviously should have succeeded in the Privy Council because when one hears what the judge had to say about him in his interim report, um, it was, well, I, I'll read you an extract from the report or from the, the Privy Council's um, summary of what the report said. It contained far too many firm statements of the misbehavior of the appellant the judge's conclusions may be summarized in this way. Armed with knowledge of the deception, the appellant continued to provide assistance to the developer, which facilitated his fraud. The appellant, um, that is Sir James Mitchell, was the moving light behind the project. His failure to inform the cabinet and parliament was inexcusable. The decision to exclude senior members of the public service was obviously made by him which suggests that such action and deliberate failure to act in accordance with the law was tantamount to misbehavior in public office. Now, that was not all. Those sorts of remarks continued over a number of pages. And um, the reason I draw them to your attention is because the Privy Council said, well, what reaction would the fair-minded and informed observer um, have when they heard that the judge, at an interim part of the case, had reached such firm conclusions against one of the parties before he had heard all the evidence, before uh, he had investigated the whole of the facts. Now, um, the judgment was couched in fairly um, 
polite terms. But Lord Clark said this, he said, the extracts from the report set out above strongly support the conclusion that having regard to the context and all the surrounding circumstances, the fair-minded observer would conclude that there is a real possibility that the respondent had made up his mind by the date of the interim report that the appellant was at the heart of the wrongdoing which led to the project and its collapse and would not be willing to change his mind so that his final report would not be impartial. So that focus on the impartial observer led inexorably to the confusion that the judge was not independent and impartial and that meant that his uh, participation in the commission had to be put to an end and uh, an order was made preventing any further um, part in the inquiry. Now I suggest that that was <coughs> plainly and obviously uh, uh, the, uh, the right application of the test. What would the fair-minded and independent observer have thought? And I suggest that it emphasizes the need for us lawyers to keep that test in mind. Because although it's worth noting that that case, um, as I've summarized it, and as I believe it was, was straightforward and led to a clear result, um, that wasn't what happened in the High Court or in the Court of Appeal. They had both found against Sir James. And if um, the matter hadn't been taken all the way, um, the, the inquiry would have continued. And um, if the uh, inference is right, he would have been um, uh, held up and uh, put into disrepute by someone who was, uh, lacked the attributes um, of the independent um, uh, tribunal. He would not, in effect, have had a fair hearing he would have been denied the right to which the, current, the Constitution uh, guarantees him. So um, that is why um, I believe that the test is important and that if it is not strictly applied and upheld, um, justice will suffer. And it is why I believe that uh, the freedom from judicial bias deserves our unceasing vigilance uh, which, by which I mean the unceasing vigilance of all of us. Uh, thank you very much. James Guthrie, QC. And, um, and very compelling um, paper. Um, and in, in discussing it, of course, and uh, one thinks of I mean, the reference in the Belizean case to the informed, or rather the fair-minded and informed um, Belizean. And I could not help but remind it, of course, of the, um, the test of the reasonable man in the Clapham Omnibus case, um, of the reasonable man test. And what is clear is that there are two different people and two different tests. I'll be intrigued to see what is, a, you know, in Trinidad and Tobago, whether or not the person in the St. James Maxi Taxi falls within one category or the other may well be something that we can look forward in the future. Many of you know that the TTLN is a membership organization. Um, it is, in fact, governed by a board of directors, but we are driven by our constitution to have members who appoint the board. And we are very fledgling. We were only appointed on the 28th of April of this year. But one of the reasons for inviting your attendance here is to give you some insight into what we do and to invite you to consider mem being a member of our organization. And, um, and in your registration packages, you would have received a little note inviting you to provide some contact information so that we can have a continuing relationship after this conference. Not so much with the intention of you being a member, but perhaps of us exciting you enough to consider whether or not you should offer yourself a membership so that we can continue the work of the TTLN. So during the break, I would certainly ask you and remind you to have a look again at that. And perhaps if you can, fill in the forms and you can deposit them right outside. There is a table outside with a very large box, which does not include lunch, but which you can put your, um, your completed forms. And speaking of lunch, I've also been um, invited by um, Simon um, 
Davenport, who is chairing our, our, um, our panel after lunch, that there is also, a, um, in, in the very same package, um, a note headed question time. Um, with at, the, at the back, it, it's blank, and it's intended to, um, to, to provoke you into perhaps burdening us with your questions and comments and remarks, and those that you would wish or invite the panel to answer or consider when we meet after lunch in panel. So again, and uh, the, the point that um, Davenport is making is that you do not necessarily confine your questions or your comments to the papers which were presented, um, but perhaps feel um, spirited enough to perhaps go a little further and um, to request of the panel um, you know, their answers or their, their views on what I would encourage you as being in provocative discussions. Let us have a really good panel speaking in an informed way, of course, and an authoritative way, and dealing with lots of the papers that have been presented, but with the context of contemporary events in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's this afternoon, and again, during your break, if you can fill in the question time paper and submit them to the registration booth. They will be taken by the presenters, and, um, and we may not be able to answer all the questions, but certainly a, a large majority of them will be answered, hopefully. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speakers, this is our final pre-lunch speakers, are Ms. Shahira Alaha and Ms. Tanil Tuit. And they will be presenting on the role of the common law in the Caribbean. Ms. Alaha was called to the bar of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in 2005 and practices in the Civil Litigation Department of Dalton's. Her portfolio is varied and includes a wide range of civil litigation claims and her principal focus and her, uh, her, her, her pet interests is in the field of personal injuries including road traffic accident claims, fatal accident claims, PIs and, um, and also of course occurring in the course of employment and clinical negligence claims. Similarly, Ms. Stewart, who is a more recent graduate, um, is also um, an associate at Dalton's, and um, she, in fact, graduated from the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom with an LLB in 2009, and was called to the bar in the United Kingdom in 2010 as a barrister at law. She is a member of the Honorable Society of the Inner Temple and was admitted to practice here in Trinidad and Tobago in 2011. She obtained her LLM in International Corporate Governance and Financial Regulations with the distinction from the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome both Ms. Stewart and, of course, Ms. Alba. Good morning, everyone. We know it's close to lunchtime, so we will try to be brief in our presentation. Our topic is the role of the common law in the Caribbean. When we heard the, the theme of this conference, recent contribution of the Caribbean to the common and constitutional law, we felt that we first must know and understand what is the common law, and then also look at how it was introduced as part of our, part of our legal system. As young lawyers, we were initially taught in the undergraduate level about what is the common law but we never really fully addressed our mind to understand truly the origins of the common law. So this paper is presented in two parts. Firstly, I will examine the history of the common law and its reception into the Commonwealth Caribbean. Thereafter, my colleague will focus on one area of the common law where post-independence post common law principles have been applied and developed to meet the needs of our society. Chief Justice Cook, one of the greatest English lawyers, wrote at the beginning of the 17th century that, beginning quote, the reason of the law is the life of the law. For though a man can tell the law, yet if he know not the reason thereof, he shall soon forget his superficial knowledge. But when he findeth the right reason of the law, and so bringeth it to his natural reason, then he can comprehend it as his own. This will not only serve him for the understanding of that particular case, but of any others. Chief Justice Cook's words resonate the ideals that all practitioners and law students should strive for, in terms of being dedicated and prudent in one understanding of the law. Whether it is tracing the roots of the area of, a, of an area of law 
so that you can gain an appreciation of how it's applied in the region. Now, when we think of what is the common law, the common law tradition describes the legal principles, substantive and procedural legal rules and institutions, which started from the early courts of, courts of law in England after the Norman conquest, and it is still applied in the courts today. The tradition of the English common law has been gradual in terms of its development as the courts advanced it on a case-by-case -case basis, particularly if the circumstances warranted a deviation from the present position. Now, most people would want to know what is the, when did the common law truly begin? The first date at which it was associated is 1066. Yes, I'm going that far back. Prior to the Norman conquest of England in 1066, there was an absence of a unified legal system in England. Basically, there were circuit judges that were going from district to district, making judicial decisions based on local customs in an effort to establish or maintain the king's peace. These common law principles started through oral pronouncements and afterwards with the introduction of court reporting, it was reproduced in a hard format that permitted litigants and their representatives to have access to the applicable laws and gain the associated benefits. In the 13th century, we saw the common laws taking a forefront in the roles of the Court of Exeter, Common Pleas and the King Bench. It was at that time we saw the emergence of common law principles based on custom and judicial decisions. However, as Slap and Kelly in their book, The English Legal System, it described the, court, the common law courts as becoming stiff. Beginning quote, the courts develop an institutional scoliosis in that they were reluctant to deal with certain issues if it was not brought in a proper form of action. As a consequence, the people appealed to the Chancellor so that they could obtain relief and justice. And hence we got the principles of equity arising. As most of you know the proverbial description, equity was as long as the Chancellor's foot. Which essentially was, it depended on the particular Chancellor and his application of justice in that particular situation. In consideration of the origins of the English common law, it should be noted that the manner in which the common law has grown, it, it has developed in a sort of organic manner. Whereas the judges apply common law principles and a precedence and allow some sort of degree of flexibility for judicial discretion and application of the relevant principles. Now when we think of the reception of the English law in Trinidad and Tobago, we look to start with the expansion of the British Empire during the colonial times. The laws of England, the English laws, sorry, were transported or received by the Commonwealth Caribbean. The manner in which these laws were received differed from island to island. Some came via conquest and or cessation, and some came via settlement. In the case of settlement, it was widely accepted that the law was brought at the time the English arrived, in that it operated from the date of the first settlement. In contrast, reception by conquest or cessation often created a turbulent introduction of the English legal system, since it meant that the laws that were introduced were a consequence of either warfare or through cession by of the former metropolitan rulers. In Trinidad and Tobago, the application of English law was de derived from us being conquered as well as being ceded. If we think back to our history classes now, in 1498, the island of Trinidad was colonized by conquest on behalf of Spain. And despite attempts by settlement by the English and Dutch, and the presence of the French during the next three centuries, Spanish authority was manifested in his country until 18th February 1797. In that, at that time, the island was surrendered under Treaty of Capitulation. This treaty was confirmed and Trinidad was formally ceded to Great Britain by the Treaty of Amens in 1802. The first conquest being by the Spanish 
Spanish law governed the island during the period 1498 to 1797. Despite the English taking control of Trinidad from 1797, Spanish law and the systems of government continued until 1831, when a legislative council was established. Gradually, we saw the introduction of English-style ordinances, where it was that the English law was substituted for the Spanish law in a number of matters. In 1848, an ordinance was passed which repealed all Spanish law in this country. However, there was much controversy at the time in the Trinidadian courts as to the application of that particular provision. In 1940, however, a declaratory ordinance was passed that effectively stated the common law, doctrines of equity, and the states of general application of the imperial parliament was in force, and that it was in force from the 1st of March, 1848. That effectively, um, that effectively took away the Spanish law from being in operation in Trinidad at that time. It is true that section 19B of the Supreme Court of Judicature Act recognizes and gives effect to all titles, rights, duties, obligations, and liabilities existing by the common law or by Spanish law or by any custom or by any written law. However, at present times, the influence of Spanish law is negligible. During the colonial times, common law and equity were also introduced. The, co the common law aspects that we gained was the law of merchants on commercial law, ecclesiastical law, and customary international law and equity. The English statutes in force were not generally applied to co Commonwealth Caribbean territories unless specified. In the Grenadian case of Attorney General versus Stewart, the court held that English statutes at that time, the particular statute, the English statute of Mortman, did not extend to Grenada, since it was enacted to deal with a specified local public mischief that was occurring in England. Similarly, during those colonial times, the courts continued to apply and or retain some of the customary laws. For example, the use of the X mark and the thumbprint by blind and illiterate persons in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly to those seeking to execute legal documents. Although there, although there has been some debate as to the validity of those executions, the courts have maintained its recognition of this customary tradition, which dates back to 1845 and the introduction, and the introduction of indenture and bonded laborers who were illiterate. In the 1960s and onwards, the majority of the English-speaking islands emerged as independent sovereign states. Many islands instituted constitutions, established parliaments, and enacted laws that encapsulated the customs, norms, and legal traditions of the colonial masters. A notable facet in most of the constitutions and the laws of these islands was saving law clauses that sought to retain the received law until such time or until a specified time or cutoff to ensure that there was a smooth transition and implementation of locally enacted legislation. In considering the extent of the common law received, one must look at what principles existed at the date assigned for the reception. In Trinidad and Tobago, by virtue of Section 12 of the Supreme Court of Judicature Act, any written law in operation on 1st March 1848 and any written law passed after that date the common law, doctrines of equity, statutes of general application of the Parliament of the UK that were in force in England on that day continued to be in force as at independence. So in Trinidad, the cut-off date was the 1st March 1848, and in Tobago, it was from the 1st January 1888. Now, in terms of the common law principles that would have derived at that time, because of the, lim the limit of, of court reporting at that period, we cannot truly see and cannot truly record what were the common law principles. But mostly from 1962, when there was the introduction of, of more legal reporting, we can note the contributions and the development of the common law as time has progressed.
Now, in terms of the cutoff date, this does not automatically translate to English decisions being made after that cutoff time being deemed irrelevant. Rather, the court treated those decisions as being of a highly persuasive nature and as such was still willing to uh, follow and or apply the principles depending on the facts of the case as well as the originating court. In the case of Mohammed versus Mohammed, Justice Kelsic recognized that any provision which incorporated the practice and procedure in England for the time being in force in the High Court of England incorporated that practice and procedure actually enforced at that particular point in time. Further by section 17 of the Court of Judicature Act, the principles of equity were retained. And when we look at section 19 of that same act, we note the elements that the court recognized and gives effect to what we're dealing with in terms of the equitable rights, such as um, rights relating to all legal claims and demands and all estates, titles, rights, duties, obligations and liabilities existing by the common law or by Spanish law or by any custom or by written law. Further, the courts have also applied the local circumstances rule, particularly where there was a need to accommodate local circumstances or conditions. In the Privy Council decision of Cooper versus Stewart in 1889, the court was called upon to determine whether the common law of perpetuities applied to New South Wales, given that it was a colony established by settlement. In the court analysis in that particular case, uh, they said that given the time that it was brought, which was 1823, the rule was no longer applicable to crown grants of land in the colony of New South Wales, or to reservations or defeasance in such grants to take effect on some more contingency, more or less remote, unless it would apply when necessary for the public good. Now in that case, what the court was really addressing was that they would look at the local circumstances to ascertain whether the particular common law principles would apply. If it did not in that instance, the court would follow what um, developed from the country. Now in the area of personal injuries, we can truly see the shift in the common law system and the contributions of the Caribbean. And my colleague will be dealing with that further on. Now, one thing that we also noticed in terms of the common law and when we're looking at it, it says in terms of the stumbling blocks to the development of the common law in the Caribbean. In our eyes, there are two major stumbling blocks. The first major stumbling block, as, we, as I mentioned briefly, was the limited case reporting. Because of this stumbling block, we have not truly traced um, in terms of the common law development from, in terms of post pre-independence and post-independence, in terms of when the cutoff period was and when the independence had gained. So we have not seen that, but we're continually developing our common law as the cases go by. Secondly, in terms of the common law, pre the cutoff point, uh, a lot of our barristers were trained in the judiciary, as, as Sir Ram Sohoy mentioned. They were trained in Britain, as that was a mandatory part of, of, of as a mandatory part of their training. And as such, the common law that was developed in the Caribbean was influenced greatly by what was present in England. I will now pass you on to my colleague. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tania. None in legendo said in telehendo legis consistent. The laws consist not in being read, but in being understood. As practitioners, we rarely see the importance of understanding the foundations and or origins of our jurisprudence. This is something we left at the doorsteps of the law school before starting practice. But in preparing this presentation, it has forced us not just to state the law, but to seek to understand the origins of it. As my colleague has said, having considered the history and origin of the common law, we now seek to discuss the role of the common law in the Commonwealth Caribbean with specific reference to the law of damages in private law. There is no statute law as to how private law damages are to be assessed. It is an area governed entirely by the common law developed by the courts over hundreds of years. 
Since the development of the common law and the Trinidad and Tobago attained independence, the practice has been that the courts look at past cases in determining the quantum of awards for damages for loss of damage, loss and damage including those as a result of tort. So that if there are previous cases in which other judges have made awards, the judge would usually rely on the awards given in those cases to guide them in making awards in later cases. Where there's a novel situation, judges sometimes look outside reported decisions for guidance and the common law system allows judges to look to other jurisdictions or to draw upon past or present judicial experience for analogy analogies to help in making a decision. This was the principle expressed in the case of Kieran Christopher versus Clarence Rampasad and another, when Justice Wendell Kangaloo, as he then was, held that in determining the quantum of damages, courts are enjoined to take by way of comparison awards in the jurisdiction in matters of a similar nature where such matters exist. Those awards are generally brought up to date using the Retail Prices Index. When no such awards have been made, then the court must look at other jurisdictions for guidance. These covered law principles were developed for the purpose of ensuring flexibility to allow judges to deal with changes that lead to unanticipated controversies whilst at the same time, stare decisis, the doctrine of stare decisis, provides certainty, uniformity, and predictability, and makes for a stable legal environment. Wooding CJ, in the well-known case of Corneliac versus St. Louis, set out fundamental principles of law which a court ought to consider when assessing damages as follows. One, the nature and extent of the injuries sustained, Two, the nature and gravity of the resulting physical disability. Three, the pain and suffering endured. Four, the loss of amenities suffered. And five, the effect on pecuniary prospects. These principles are still being applied in personal injuries claims throughout the Commonwealth Caribbean today. For example, in Belize, in a case, Adolf Van Colbier versus Romel Burgess and Manuel Perez, Justice Muria relied on the principles set out above in the interest of achieving consistency in determining the issue of damages for personal injuries arising from a road traffic accident. In the Eastern Caribbean states, the Court of Appeal in Alfred versus Thomas and another held that the principles expressed in the Corneliac and St. Louis case were the principles to be applied. Since then, the Commonwealth Caribbean and certainly Trinidad and Tobago have adopted these general principles to be followed and in the assessment of, general, in the assessment of damages in personal injuries matters, um, that is, one, the purpose, is, the purpose of damages is to compensate the injured party, not to punish. An award of damages is to restore the claimant to the position he would have been in if the tort complained of had not been committed. Damages should be full and adequate, and in most Commonwealth Caribbean jurisdictions, damages are assessed once and for all, and compensation is given not only for loss and injury, which has already accrued, but also for loss and injury, which might develop at a future date. The Privy Council continues to be our highest court of appeal, and in recent times, the Privy Council has given guidance to judges and practitioners of the Commonwealth Caribbean as to how these principles of common law can be developed to meet their societal conditions and demands. In the case of Peter C. Passard versus Theophilus Passard and Capital Insurance Limited, the Privy Council set out their reservations about the usefulness of resorting to awards of damages in cases decided a number of years ago with the accompanying need to extrapolate the amounts awarded with, into modern values.
Whilst the methodology of using comparisons is sound, it is an ex inexact science and one which should be exercised with some caution. More so, it is important to ensure that in comparing awards of damages for physical injuries, one is comparing like with like, bearing in mind that where the authorities are of some antiquity, such comparisons can do no more than demonstrate a trend in very rough and general terms. Though in the Peter C. Passad case, the Privy Council was reluctant to interfere with the award by the Court of Appeal, stating that it was a product of the views of the appellate court on a topic particularly within their own jurisdiction. In the case of Alfie Subaya versus the Attorney General, the Privy Council held that due to the passage of time and changes in the value of money, since some of the earlier awards, the level of compensatory damages may call for, upward, for upwards revision by the courts of Trinidad and Tobago. In the circumstances, there has been a general trend towards an increase in the range of damages for general damages for pain, suffering, and loss of amenities, depending on the injuries suffered by the particular litigant and the effect with the, which the injuries has had on his or her enjoyment of life. In the area of the assessment of damages for future loss of earnings, the traditional multiplier, multiplicand approach applies. The Commonwealth Caribbean adopted this approach from the English law and it is applied today. However, in England, the law has developed in that they now rely on actuarial tables prepared by the government actuaries department to provide an aid for those assessing the lump sum award for continuing future pecuniary loss. The law in the Commonwealth Caribbean has not developed in the same way. In the Peter C. Passard case, the Privy Council considered the approach adopted by the Trinidad and Tobago courts in selecting a figure for the multiplier which, prior to that case, had always been a rough estimate based on the age of the claimant and the probable length of his future working life. In that case, the Privy Council held that in order to give a proper compensation to the claimant, in addition to the age and probable length of the claimant's working life, the interest rates in Trinidad and Tobago would have to be considered and some allowances made for the contingencies in life. In this area, the common law has developed further and in certain circumstances where there are uncertainties or imponderables, the Trinidad and Tobago courts have considered whether they can reject the traditional multiplier and multiplicand approach of assessing damages and instead, in favor, choose a global broad brush approach as enunciated in the English case of Blamire versus South Cumbria Health Authority. On the issue of mitigation of damages, the Privy Council in the case of Salvania Salvaniagam versus the University of the West Indies held that the burden of proof on the issue of mitigation was on the plaintiff to show that he acted reasonable, reasonably in all the circumstances and this was their law which was applied in the Commonwealth Caribbean. Though this was in opposition or despite the earlier case, English case of Ghana Green Company versus uh, HMF4 and Fairclough Limited and Bridge Corporation, which set out the position that on the issue of mitigation, the defendant will have to establish not only that the plaintiff is able to return to work, but there is work available for the plaintiff to do. In an appeal emanating from the court of courts in St. Lucia, Geist PLC versus Lantico, on this issue, that is the mitigation of damages and on whom the burden of proof will lie, the Privy Council held that the dis earlier decision in Salvaniagam versus the University of West Indies, the, that principle cannot be relied on as an accurate statement of the law on this particular point. The common law so we can see that the common law continues to play a dynamic role in developing the jurisprudence in the Commonwealth Caribbean, particularly in the area of personal injuries and damages. And it allows for a certain amount of flexibility, whilst at the same time providing certainty, uniformity and predictability to some extent under the doctrine of stare decisis and makes for a stable legal environment.
And as we can see from the cases that emanated from the Privy Council, the English law and the, um, also the decisions from the Privy Council also plays an important part in the development of the common law in the Commonwealth Caribbean in two ways. One, as my friend had set out, it is the foundation for our existing law. And two, by having the Privy Council as our final court of appeal, we can still be guided to ensure that the common law continues to grow and develop to meet the needs of our current society. And in this case, and having regard to this particular lecture and what we're here to do today in terms of continuing legal education, one would hope that um, the Commonwealth Caribbean judges and practitioners and students alike all play a greater and more active role in terms of developing the common law in the Commonwealth Caribbean for themselves and to meet our own needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Alahan Tewitt. In fact, the organizing committee um, was an apology to both of them because when we were devising or when we were inviting them to give us their topics, we were extremely, um, we said to them, there's no way you can crystallize and distill 1,000 years of English common law and the doctrine of stare decisis in 30 minutes, but they've proven us wrong. They've done that eloquently and extremely persuasively because for my own right, I didn't actually know that Section 19 of the Supreme Court of Judicature preserved, I knew it preserved the common law, but I actually did not know it also preserved the rights, entitlements as state of Spanish law as well, which in fact is extraordinary. But yes, I'd, and um, the other point is that, um, and this is part of the recitation right up to the present, many of you may be aware that the Allen case from the Privy Council, which was reported on January of this year, has, um, has put the loss of a chance of speculative damages, the Chaplin and Hicks um, notion of speculative damages in some context, and has in effect invited judicial officers who sit in an assessing capacity that notwithstanding the difficulties of assessing and monetizing loss and damage, that there is an obligation to do so, and it's not as easy to just pull out the notion of a nominal damages to in effect reward somebody who has suffered loss and damage. So we can see the evolving and dynamic role of the common law, and I'm grateful that Trent Tobago has played such a pivotal role in that. Good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are at lunch. I didn't start there, but when I chose to go first as a student, I remember a friend saying to me at the time, he said, you're, you're moving to England. I said, yes, I'm quite excited about it. He said, well, all I can say is, if you like the weather, you'll love the food. <laughs> so it's, it's nice to be uh, here where um, uh, there are no complaints about either the weather or the food. Thanks for hosting us. Now, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to cut back on uh, the uh, introductions. You have bios of our speakers in your materials. I would commend those to you. Please do, do read those. Um, we're going to take things a little out of order um, to accommodate our next speaker's uh, commitments this afternoon. And, and fortunately, uh, this, our next speaker is somebody who needs no introduction, certainly in this, this audience. He's been an Attorney General of Trinidad twice. Uh, he's been Attorney General twice, and, and uh, John Jeremy, uh, Senior Counsel, has also been a High Commissioner in the UK, so he may have his views on English weather as well. Um, but in any event, uh, John, I'm going to invite you to come forward and, and just speak, and we'll see if we can catch up on some of the time. Thank you. <laughs> 
Good afternoon. This, this afternoon, I've been asked to speak on the topic parliamentary privilege in the Caribbean. I wondered why I have been given this controversial topic, especially at this time. But I have, and I shall try to deal with it manfully. I've chosen in the brief time, I think I have 20 minutes, that I have been allotted to speak to current events, locating them through the lens of history, for it is only through that lens, I believe, that much of our current difficulties can be understood. And I have selected two events, which to my mind, disclose certain of the most flagrant forms of disregard for proper parliamentary process to ground my discussion of privilege. A privilege, to use the language of Hofeld, cannot exist without an obligation that serves to guard it from abuse. The first event on which I have chosen to speak is one that I, am, I feel sure that most, if not all, of you have long forgotten. It concerns the attempt by the then Speaker of the House and my friend, Barry Sinanan, to refer on the 4th of March 2009 the Urban Development Corporation of Trinidad and Tobago, UDICOT, a company owned by the state that had been mired in allegations of corruption when I was Attorney General to the Privileges Committee of the House. UDICOT had placed a full-page advertisement in two of the daily newspapers which enjoyed the widest circulation in Trinidad and Tobago under the caption, Statement by Opposition MP, Reckless and Irresponsible. The advertisement was in response to a speech made in the Parliament by the then member of the Opposition, Dr. Tim Gopisingh, in which the member had accused Uricot of being involved in, and I quote, corruption, non-transparency and non-accountability, end of quote, with taxpayers' monies. He had also severely criticized its selection for the construction of the Point Fortin Hospital. In its advertisement, Udicott condemned the statements of the member. They correctly noted that they had been made under what is commonly described as the coward's cloak of parliamentary privilege. Udicott dared the member, and I quote, to repeat his spurious allegations outside the parliamentary chamber, end of quote. The speaker relied on a passage in May's parliamentary practice which describes the molestation of members in Parliament as being capable of amounting to a possible breach of parliamentary privilege. He ruled that a prima facie case based on a breach of privilege had occurred and referred Udicott to the Standing Committee of the House that is known as the Committee of Privileges. That's the first event. The second event that I have chosen as a backdrop to my remarks stems, perhaps inevitably, from our very recent past. Unlike the first, I feel certain that all of you will remember the facts that underpin this event. On the 6th of May, 2015, Amir one month ago to the day, the leader of the parliamentary opposition was suspended after a motion which described itself to be 
a motion of censure was passed in the House of Representatives. The motion, notwithstanding its description, provided for the immediate suspension of the member from the service of the House for the remainder of the parliamentary term, which is even now in progress. The motion was in substance rooted in an allegation that the member had breached privilege by reading into the Hansard what the leader of government business on the move of the motion described to be false emails. If true, this would ordinarily, in the practice of this parliament, have been the subject of a motion of abuse of privilege, which, once the speaker had declared it to have been established on a prima facie basis, would have been referred to the Committee of Privileges for that committee to hear evidence and arrive at a decision which would then have been reported back to the full house for action. These two examples that I have selected are instances in which the parliamentary privilege of free speech that lies at the heart of the parliamentary privileges arrogated by the Commons at Westminster in the aftermath of the glorious revolution we in issue. The freedom of speech privilege was one that served individual members of the Commons as well as the Commons itself. Article 9 of the Bill of Rights contained other privileges. Not only were the proceedings in the Commons outside the writ of the King's Courts, but Parliament and its legislation was free from subjugation to the law of nature, the law of God, and the common law, all being areas of influence that the Crown had previously sought to assert dominance over the Commons. The Commons could punish for contempt as part of their unqualified jurisdiction to regulate their own procedure without reference to the ordinary courts and could also exercise a penal jurisdiction all of its own. The two local events that I refer to clearly represent, in my view, parliamentary overreach. In the case of Udicott, the Speaker's ruling that Udicott, a limited liability state corporation, could not exercise the right of robust reply to a member who had, under the cloak of parliamentary privilege, and whatever its many misdeeds, for there were many on the part of Unicot, had quite clearly defamed the company. In the case of the suspension of the leader of opposition, the leader of the opposition, the parliament dispensing with the ordinary procedure to remedy a breach of the privilege of free speech, a reference to the committee of privileges of the house, arrogated to itself the power to charge, to hear evidence, and to rule that a breach of privilege had in fact occurred in circumstances that would warrant the immediate suspension of the leader of the opposition. I think, as I have said, that both of the, these actions were not simply plainly wrong, but were also unlawful. And I say so for these reasons. Mays defines parliamentary privilege as, and I quote, the sum of the peculiar rights enjoyed by each house collectively as a constituent of the High Court of Parliament and by members of each house individually without which they could not discharge their functions. The purpose of the privilege was articulated as long ago as 1675 when the Commons asserted that privilege existed 
so that members might freely attend the public affairs of the House without disturbance or interruption. It is difficult to comprehend how the exercise by Unicot of its right of reply, as robust as it was, or the suspension of the leader of the opposition could properly be said to offend against parliamentary privilege in this sense, the more so in the context of a written constitution that provides for freedom of speech as a guaranteed right. Neither of these events has, however, been challenged in the courts. This has, in my opinion, more to do with the time-honored reluctance of our courts to interfere in the internal processes of our parliament and the concomitant reluctance of pot potential litigants to sue. But that reluctance, itself a reflection of privilege, we must remember, is rooted in British history, traditions, and conventions. In a host of cases, the Privy Council has affirmed the relevance of the British approach to parliamentary privilege that is articulated in Article 9 of the Bill of Rights. But as Adrian Saunders, judge of the Caribbean Court of Justice has remarked, and I quote, it is not difficult to understand the wider principle of Article 9 in the context of parliamentary sovereignty and against the historical background of a House of Commons assertive of its independence and anxious to ensure that its privileges were not determined ultimately by the other house, the House of Lords. In Trinidad and Tobago with a written constitution and no possibility of a trespass by the Senate, the other House of Parliament, that is not a House of Lords, the position ought in principle to be different. There have been, it is true, tepid attempts to confront the principle of parliamentary privilege by our courts. One such was Toussaint versus the Attorney General, of which my colleague and friend, Mr. Maraj, spoke earlier this morning. In Toussaint, the Privy Council read down the provision in the Vincentian Privileges Act which required a litigant to obtain the speaker's permission before evidence could be adduced as to what had been said in Parliament. That evidence was critical to a constitutional motion that Toussaint wished to pursue. The speaker, a certain parliamentary privilege, refused to give it. The Privy Council ordered that it be given. But the more robust approach adopted by Hamel Smith G, as he then was, in Boudram versus the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, is probably to be preferred in our context. In Boudram, the privilege which was sought to be asserted was analogous to that which was sought to be used in Toussaint. The state argued that the publication in Parliament of a report, the infamous Scott drug report, was no business of Mr. Boudram, whose name was mentioned throughout the report and that its publication could create no right of action against the state for a breach of Mr. Boudram's constitutional right to a fair trial. The argument was that the collective privilege that Parliament enjoyed meant that its proceedings could not be inquired into or impeached in a court of law. In that case, Mr. Justice Hammond Smith held that as long as, and I quote, as long as what is said in Parliament by a member does not infringe the provisions of the Constitution, 
that immunity, and he's speaking there of the privilege, is assured. But he went on to say, crucially, that a democracy which claims not only to have respect for the fundamental rights of its citizens, but which makes express provision in its constitution to entrench and preserve those rights should never appear to entertain the suggestion that members of parliament are free to do what they like, provided it is done within its walls. The oath taken by its members demands of them respect for the constitution. In the Trinidad and Tobago Civil Rights Association versus the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, which is another of Mr. Mirage's cases, and I must confess I happened to be on the other side of that at the time as Attorney General. <laughs> Gobin G observed that parliamentary privilege must yield to the court's duty to give the Constitution the primacy which it is due. The case was subsequently overruled by the Court of Appeal, but that dicta, in my view, represents an accurate statement of principle. A similar approach was adopted by the Supreme Court of India in Raja Rampal versus the Speaker, in which MPs were shown on television accepting money for posing questions in Parliament. The MPs attempted to approach the courts for relief after being expelled by the Parliament. The Parliament asserted that the courts lacked jurisdiction and that the Parliament alone had the exclusive right to discipline MPs a right in respect of which they were not answerable to the judiciary. This was, of course, an assertion of privilege. A majority of the Supreme Court of India held that if an allegation is made by a citizen that he has been unconstitutionally deprived of his fundamental rights as a result of the exercise of a parliamentary power or privilege, the court has a duty to examine this question, notwithstanding the claim to privilege. And that, colleagues, is, I think, the short point. Our constitution in Section 55 is in terms similar to the Indian constitution in Article 105. And it provides that parliamentary privilege is subject to the provisions of the Constitution. The precise words used in the Constitution are that subject to the provisions of this Constitution and to the rules and standing orders regulating the procedure of the Senate and the House of Representatives, there shall be freedom of speech in the Senate and House of Representatives. A complicated issue arises in the sense that Section 55 also provides in Section 55.3 that in other respects, the powers, privileges, and immunities of each house and of the members and the committees of each house shall be such as may from time to time be prescribed by Parliament after the commencement of this Constitution. And until so defined, shall be those of the House of Commons of the Parliament of the United Kingdom and of its members and committees at the commencement of this Constitution. The House of Representatives Privileges Act can arguably be said to be a prescribed act under Section 55.3, and that is so notwithstanding the fact that it was enacted before the passage of the 1976 Republican Constitution. If one analyzes carefully the savings and transitional provisions in the 1962 and the 1976 constitutions, that is a result that is 
possible to arrive at. If this is correct, then the privileges of the commons do not apply in Trinidad, notwithstanding the apparent express terms of Section 55.3, so that little regard, if any, ought to be paid to Article 9 of the Bill of Rights. In any event, I suggest that the Bill of Rights, framed as it was, to treat with the struggle in England between Parliament and the monarchy should be of little significance in the context of written constitutions in states in which that problem simply never existed. And in a context where the written constitution itself makes provision for the privileges of the Parliament. But simply, the time has perhaps come for the courts to exercise a greater role in overseeing parliamentary matters. It is not now enough, in my view, for the courts to have regard to what is said in the parliament, as in Pepper and Hart and Toussaint versus the Attorney General. The courts must go further to inquire whether conduct in parliament violates the supreme law the Constitution, as is suggested in Budram versus the Attorney General, and the Indian case of Raja Rampal versus the Speaker. If Parliament acts so as to breach entrenched rights, even those of a member, as was perhaps the case with the leader of the opposition, it is for the courts to sanction a breach of rights, notwithstanding the existence of the traditional privileges of the commons at Westminster. The recent collapse of our parliamentary conventions, in my view, requires that now more than before, our courts and litigants should begin to exercise with increasing confidence the powers they arguably possess to ensure that parliamentary privilege does not operate to exempt from judicial scrutiny conduct which, in the words of Justice Hamill Smith in Boudram, would otherwise be unlawful outside the walls of Parliament. Thank you. Very learned um, exposition for the reminder that uh, uh, parliamentary privilege was relevant in 1675, uh, if anything, uh, even more relevant uh, today. The debate about it, the constitutional context that, uh, in a sense, defines it, um, the role of the courts, and uh, by, def by as a corollary, the role of lawyers in, in uh, making sure that we keep it in, in its proper place. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, for good reason. Over the last day or two, my waistline's been expanding. Um, now my chest is going to expand a little bit because I, it's my um, uh, pleasure to be able to introduce uh, the next three or four speakers, all of whom share chambers with me, and uh, I'm delighted to, to, to keep their company. The first of those is uh, Thomas Rowe, uh, Queen's Council. Thomas, I invite you to join me here on the stage. Again, I'm not going to read Thomas's um, biographical note to you, but I commend uh, it to you. Uh, when you read it, you'll, you'll see that uh, Tom is a, a rising star at the bar, um, well respected for, for his advocacy. Um, I think it was particularly notice, noticeable that um, when Tom took Silk last year, the fact that judges from the Supreme Court on down came along to that celebration uh, when we celebrated it uh, at Middle Temple. And uh, uh, I think, Tom, for good reason, you should be very proud of uh, the respect that your work has commanded at the bar. But I think Tom is going to talk to us now about dissenting judgments. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, the American behavioral psychologist, uh, Professor Daniel Kahneman, um, in his book called Thinking Fast and Slow, 
describes a study which was carried out into the behavior of parole judges in Israel. The practice there is that a criminal seeking parole has on average about six minutes to persuade the panel that he is sufficiently reformed to deserve parole, after which the judge, judges decide there and then uh, whether to grant or to refuse. And the judges hear case after case in rapid succession with three breaks during the day for refreshment. Crucially for the study, the time of each grant or refusal is noted. Uh, on average, parole is granted